Good morning, everyone. I'm Councilmember Jamani Williams, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, joined today by Councilmember uh, Rosie Mendez, Councilmember Carlos Machaca, Councilmember uh, Barry Grodenchik. We're here to hold a hearing on proposed intro number 385B, proposed intro number 1307A, and intro number 1589. Proposed intro number 385B, sponsored by Councilmember Rosie Mendez, would establish responsibilities for building owners in relation to indoor asthma, allergens, and pest management. The bill will also establish classifications of violations for indoor asthma allergens and the pests and dates of correction for such violations. This bill would also require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to report on the act its activities to educate physicians and health care providers who treat persons with asthma about the role of indoor allergens and asthma exacerbation. Proposed intro number 1307A, sponsored by myself and Councilman McCornegy, by request, oh no, sorry, sponsored by myself, by request of the mayor would update existing charter re requirements for Department of Buildings Inspector qualifications. Entry number 1589, uh, also sponsored by myself and this one with Councilman McCornegy, would increase the number of permitted boarders, rumors, or lodgers in a private dwelling such as for bed and breakfast to not more than four people. The correct bill language does not specify that this is only for one or two family homes, which is my intent, so that is an amendment I will be seeking for the bill as it goes through the legislative process. I uh, now call on Councilman Mendez for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for me, it is important to provide some background with the trajectory of this proposed legislation, Intro 385B, known as the Asthma Free Homes Act. This legislation was first introduced by then public advocate Betsy Gottbaum and myself back in 2008. It was then known as Intro 750, and it ceased to exist at the end of that legislative term without having a hearing, but with lively discussion with the then mayoral administration. I reintroduced this legislation in 2010 when it was then known as Intro 224. I held off on Intro 224 as discussions with the mayoral administration led to a compromise compromise bill known as the Alternative Enforcement Program with Asthma Triggers. Intro 436 became Local Law 7 of 2011. The understanding then was always that Local Law 7 would allow the city to gather data on mold and vermin from buildings entering the Alternative Enforcement Program, and that this data would be helpful to determine what sections of intro 224 were essential to keep, and what changes, if any, would be made to the proposed legislation. However, there was insufficient data since buildings entering the alternative enforcement program were staying longer than anticipated and did not in the program and did not produce meaningful data for analysis pertaining to mold and vermin. Intro 224 ceased to exist at the end of that legislative term. In 2014, I reintroduced this legislation, now known as Intro 385B. And in June of 2015, I met with individuals from HPD and DOHMH who expressed support for the intent of the legislation but were concerned with fiscal impact and certain provisions of the bill. They offered to draft language that would minimize the fiscal impact to the city, as well as address the issues that they, had, that they had with certain sections of the bill. I was amenable and was promised a draft in several weeks. Several months later, I received a draft that completely replaced Intro 385. It was unacceptable to me and to the advocates in the coalition that I was working with. This led to a year-long process from September of 2015 to October of 2016, where my office and the advocates worked with the agencies on drafting language that would be amenable to all parties. And then, in fact, Chair Williams scheduled a hearing in November of 2015, and in the interest of working in good faith, I requested that the hearing be deferred. Quite honestly, this process was rather frustrating since the agencies delivered comments or rewrites weeks or months after the agreed upon deadlines within our group. And at some point, the Mayor's Office of Legislative 
Affairs determined that other city agencies, DEP and NYCHA, needed to vet intro 385. My frustrations and that of the advocates with the slow pace of the negotiations led me to call for a hearing, which was scheduled for today. In closing, this is important legislation that time has come. We have 47 of 51 council members and the public advocate on this bill. This bill will codify mold and integrated pest management into the Housing Maintenance Code and will delineate a process for abatement and work practices, providing a timeline for inspection and reinspection. This legislation elevates these violations to the serious life impacting and debilitating disease that is caused by mold and pest infestation. Our year-long process of working on the bill was not for naught. We brought down the fiscal, imp the fiscal impact to the city substantially. We were not able to agree on all aspects of changes to the bill, but this bill incorporates a lot of the recommendations by the city agencies. The IBO put out a report which laid out how much this would cost the city and how much the city would recoup. So this is good common sense legislation that time has come. I want to note that there is a provision of the bill with DOHMH had some issues with the physician referral. I refer to this section of the bill as the Dr. Matthews Hurley provision. Dr. Matthews Hurley from the Doctors' Council worked on this legislation in our coalition for years. He passed away earlier this year, and in his memory, we want to keep this provision in the bill and name it after him. Lastly, lastly, I want to thank the Coalition for Asthma-Free Homes. Too many members to name, but you should know that your advocacy on this issue for over a decade will result in meaningful legislation that will impact the lives, improve the health and living condition of New York City tenants. I want to thank you for trusting me to shepherd this bill through this rather long legislative process. And I want to thank Chair Williams for scheduling this very important hearing today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, and just a few words on, on my bill 1589. Uh, which increase the number of borders, rumors, and lodges in private dwelling, uh, such as and particularly for bed and breakfast. I just want to make sure we understand the impetus. Uh, we uh, have been dealing, many know, uh, in, in this council, and me in particular, and others like Councilman Rosenthal and Carnegie, uh, with uh, the abuses and deception of uh, particularly Airbnb, but other others that abuse the system and their deceptive practices and just outright lies about how they conduct their businesses. And we assured folks that we are focused on particularly multiple dealings and the most egregious actors, and that any legislation we were supporting either in the state or in the city uh, was not to affect uh, small uh, homeowners, particularly one or two families, possibly uh, one to four. And we were correct. Uh, uh, at the same time, there was uh, arcane laws uh, still on the books that are being used, unfortunately, to harm uh, one or two family homeowners, sometimes three or four family homeowners. We want to make sure that uh, we back up what we say with action. Uh, those are not our intended uh, focuses. We believe they're using uh, the platforms legally and should continue to do so. And whatever we can do to fix that, we want to try to do so. And this bill is an attempt to do that. Uh, nothing to encourage uh, continued deceptive behaviors on multiple dwellings, uh, particularly rent regulated apartments. With that, I'd like to thank my staff for the work they did to assemble this hearing, including Mike Toomey, my legislative director, Megan Channing, Guillermo Pacino, counsel to the committee, Jose Conde, policy analyst of the committee, and Sarah Gaston, the committee's finance analyst. I'd like to remind everyone who would like to testify today to please fill out a card with the sergeant. Uh, we have our first panel, Patrick Whaley, AC External Affairs, Sharon Neal, DC Finance and Administration, DOB, Christopher DeAndre, Director of Environmental Health Assessment and Communications, DOHMH, 
Deborah Nagin, Director of Health and Homes Program, DOHMH, Vito Mosachillo, HPD, uh, Christian Kofasna, Executive Director, Mayor's Office of Special Enforcement. And I, if I'm not mistaken, are we going to go with uh, 1589 first? Is that what I'm talking about? Okay. Uh, if everybody can please raise your right hand. Do you firmly tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. And you can begin in the order of your preference. Good morning, Chair Williams, and member of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. My name is Christian Klosner, and I'm the Executive Director of the Office of Special Enforcement, also known as OSE, which is overseen by the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Patrick Whaley, Assistant Commissioner of External Affairs at New York City Department of Buildings, is with me to answer questions as well. My office's mandate, originating from a mayoral executive order in 2006, is to focus on addressing issues affecting public safety, community livability, and property values, or that can lead to the growth of serious crimes. The city is focused on improving affordability and access to permanent housing. Protecting affordable housing stock and building a new generation of the same are both key priorities of this administration. With regard to the topic of this hearing, transient lodging, specifically bed and breakfasts, the city must evaluate any legislative proposal of this nature within the broader context of all transient lodging. Transient lodging I'm using is an umbrella layperson term that's commonly used to refer to buildings that provide temporary housing for fewer than 30 days at a time, which would include what are called bed and breakfasts. However, legally speaking, there is not a city definition of what constitutes a bed and breakfast. Instead, the laws that govern transient housing exist as a complex web of state and local laws that together ensure not just a robust housing stock, but also public safety protections. Therefore, piecemeal legislation that attempts to regulate or deregulate transient lodging is highly problematic given the complexity of the governing legal landscape. Intro 1589 proposes codifying an increase in the number of transient border occupancy in one and two family homes from two borders to four borders. Unfortunately, this bill is both too narrow and too broad. There are numerous legal and regulatory issues surrounding bed and breakfasts, and this bill alone will not address these many issues. Additionally, this bill will legalize activity that is not exclusive to bed and breakfasts. While the bill aims to carve out bed and breakfasts from OSE enforcement, the proposal itself will result in an increase in transient populations citywide. An increase in transient populations inherently creates, one, an increase in negative quality of life behavior due to increased traffic in areas zoned and designed for permanent residential living, two, an increased cost of housing or rental prices, three, a decrease in available housing stock, and four, adverse impacts to homeless individuals seeking permanent housing. Nonetheless, we're committed to working with the City Council on addressing all forms of transient lodging as this issue remains important and complex. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm available to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you. We've been joined by Councilmember Rodriguez and Espinal. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the testimony. Um, it's so I understand that the the way the bill is written uh, could it, it may expand to all transit populations and all buildings. I guess is what it's, you seem to be trying to say. Um, but if we add additional language to clarify that it's not for that, it's particularly for one or two family homes. Does that satisfy some of the issues that you have? I, this is, you know, again, this is part of a larger subset of a range of activity, as you noted in your in your opening statement. And we're very concerned that tweaking any one portion of what is constitutes transient lodging can have unintended consequences that ripple out to the broader context. Um, just focusing it on one or two family homes alone is still going to empower lots of activity uh, that is otherwise illegal. And uh, we're, we're deeply concerned at looking at the full range of impacts this will have. And so I agree that it's a complex web. 
we can't address all of the web. I mean, we can try some of it at state, but we, it's hard for us to sit by and do nothing. I mean, particularly, we've told the one, two family homeless that we're not going after them. Um, but they are going, they are unfortunately uh, dealing with a lot of problems, enforcement from your office in particular. Uh, I know you say you don't go after them, you only respond to 311, but still they're, they, they need uh, some reprieve. And we told them that we would provide it. So we can't wait till we can deal with the uh, complex web. We can deal with it parts at a time. Um, we know they may need a zoning change to try to address it fully. But until then, we have to do something. Do you have, uh, do you have another alternative? What we've asked is that OSC not go after um, these uh, bed and breakfast owners. That hasn't happened. So they're still getting fined, they're still getting tickets. Uh, some of it is endangering their livelihood. And we as a city council have said we're not going after you. And so uh, we're not, I don't know that we're being truthful with them because that's what's happening. And so we have to do something. So do you have an alternative? Well, I, I'm glad you raised this. I think some of, the, some of the confusion has been that when the multiple dwellings law was amended in 2010 and did not apply to one and two family homes, that that created the impression that one or two family homes were not regulated. <laughs> For decades, the city has required that permanent housing in the city be used permanently and in compliance with a building certificate of occupancy. Um, our enforcement does touch on one or two family homes because uh, through the spread of illegal short-term rentals, it's not in high-rises anymore. It's now in every housing stock in the city. Sorry, say that part again? Illegal short-term renting is not just confined to high-rises in Manhattan anymore. It's now in every diverse housing stock throughout the city, and including one or two family homes. One and two family homes are a vital source of, a, of housing in the city um, and a critical part of the housing stock. If, especially in a two family home, if one of the two units is taken off of the permanent housing market and put into the transient rental market, that's one fewer home that a New York family can live in, one fewer home that could possibly house the growing population of homeless. And that's the particular concern that we are focused on. And so I, I don't want to conflate um, individuals who are attempting to operate a bed and breakfast with all one or two family homes. Uh, and I do want to be very clear that, um, that one or two family homes with a certificate of occupancy for permanent residential use cannot engage in short-term rentals beyond the lawful two roomers and boarders. In addition, it is absolutely critical that the permanent occupant of every dwelling unit, one if it's one family, two dwelling units if it's two family, our home and maintaining a common household with any roomers or boarders. That means full access to the entire, the entwi entire dwelling unit. So you're bringing up uh, another philosophical issue of whether or not um, it should one or two family homeowners should be able to uh, operate as a bed and breakfast as of, as of right, I guess. And we were clear that we were focusing on multiple dwellings. All of us, all of us that have been uh, rightfully bashing Airbnb, <laughs> Uh, we're saying we're focused on um, multiple dwellings. And we also said that uh, one or two families should feel free to continue to use it. We still believe that, that it is true. I guess I can parse um, for what you're saying that that might be true as long as they're following the certific certificate of occupancy that currently exists. Um, we are now because, uh, I guess, uh, OSC and administration is not backing us up by saying, please don't go after these folks. Uh, we now have to change the law to protect them uh, in the way that we said we would. And so um, if you have an alternative to do that, or if you're saying that you believe some people should be able to use B&B, &B, I need to understand how you're differentiating that and how we're going to protect the people you're going after right now, actually. There's people who are being harmed right now, and we want to stop that. My office is tasked with enforcing a wide variety of state and local laws, and we will enforce them when we find violence. Can you bring it close? I'm sorry. Oh, it's, it's still problematic. Okay. Sorry. Is this better? My, my office is tasked with the enforcement of a wide variety of state and local laws. We do not ignore violations when we find them. Um, you mentioned earlier that you understand that we're going to bed and breakfast only in response to 311 complaints, and I think that's an important point because there is a perception that we are um, engaged in a wide-scale attempt to go after bed and breakfast, which is not the case at all. Um, we are we are going to buildings where we receive complaints, and if it turns out that the owner is calling out a bed and breakfast, we are treating it as what the law treats it as, a one-family home, a two-family home, whatever it is, and ensuring that they are in compliance with all the rules and regulations. 
Um, and I, I don't think that it is harming a person to make sure that they are in compliance with the law, that the city is engaged in law enforcement in a wide variety of places. Our expectation is that people comply with the laws. Um, we are committed to discussing with you what those laws should be as long as they're addressing the full, wide-ranging uh, realm of transient lodging and not just one particular section. So I, I just want to make sure we're clear, because you're saying, of course, you don't think it's harming someone if you're trying to get them to follow the law. Got it. But just to parse it out, is one, following the law, two, is the law correct? And so we are trying to correct the law, and you still seem to be opposed to that. And so I don't understand why. So I, I get it. If the law is what it is now, and we've tried to say, please don't enforce it in this way because this is not what we intended, but that's still happening. So now we want to change it so that you no longer have to do that, so we don't have to have the discussion. But you still seem to be opposed to even changing it so that you wouldn't have to enforce it. That I don't fully understand. Uh, so, um, again, we are happy to talk about what the law should be in the broadest of contexts, as opposed to in one particular situation. Um, you know, it, it's hard to talk about what should be allowed in a bed and breakfast in the absence of a legal definition, and we're very concerned about the unintended consequences. One, in particular, is the way the bill is drafted now, is that by changing the definition of family in the housing maintenance code, that impacts not just one and two families, but also multiple dwellings. And while well, wait, just a pause, because we're going to make sure we correct that language so that we don't affect multiple dwellings. So we can take that one off of the table. And, but there still could be, and you know, and, and this is what I'm offering, is that is that we talk about the other consequences. This could still have major impacts on the housing stock. This will, um, it's likely that this could diminish the number of housing units available in a roommate situation. Um, a three-bedroom apartment that would have had three roommates living permanently could now, under this bill, quite easily be one person living with four roomers or boarders um, in an area that is not designed for transient use and doesn't have the safety precautions in place to support that transient use. So, I, you know, so I, what I'm saying is that it is, it is not so simple to just focus on a, a group of homeowners acting in one particular way to say we would like to be able to do this and I, I'm not opposed to the council pursuing that and we're committed to having that conversation but it has to be comprehensive and take into account that there are lots of other kinds of uses that that will be affected by the language. So we've been talking about this for quite some time and there are some legitimate things that you're saying but we've got nothing from the administration. We've got nothing about how to uh, make them uh, I guess, for lack of a better word, more legal, describe them differently. We've got nothing to say we will assist you in doing zoning changes. We've got nothing except continued uh, enforcement of the law, even though we're saying uh, this is not what we intended. And so in the absence of that, this council is going to act. If you have something else uh, that can help protect uh, these uh, businesses and these homeowners, then we want to hear it. But saying no because it's too complicated is not going to be a good, a good response. Uh, many of us have spoken to your office, and there will be multiple occasions saying what the problem is, talking for the aggrieved owners, and we got basically crickets uh, in terms of what can be done to provide some kind of reprieve for these owners. Uh, and I think we've been more than clear about who we were going after and who we were not. And because we got nothing back, we had to provide our own response. Uh, now you're bringing up things without another response. And so I'm asking, if you have another response, we either need to hear it or you need to stop the enforcement uh, on these owners who we have said uh, we believe are performing legally and were not the intended target. So there isn't already an, intended tar uh, an, an unintended consequence. You're providing the unintended consequence. We have to fix it. Um, you haven't said anything that leads me to believe why we shouldn't fix it with this bill. I agree it's more complex and more comprehensive. Uh, but we have to do something now. And so uh, my intent is to continue to move the bill forward unless you can show well, how there will be additional harm. I agree with the way you're saying the, the language is written, although we believe the certificate of occupancy would have applied to the people above that anyway. But yet and still, we're going to clarify very clearly 
uh, that we're not, to, uh, we're not trying to uh, bring this to multiple dwellings. We're focused only on the small homeowners. And so that takes that off the table. You're now going into a philosophical discussion of whether or not they should be allowed to. And that's another discussion. I'm happy to have it. Uh, but we need to have it, have, have it very quickly because I intend as the chair and, and the co-prime of this bill to move forward expeditiously uh, to provide some recourse for the owners in my district and, and throughout the city. Uh, I'm, I think there's questions. Do you have questions about this? Yeah. I Councilman, if I could, just sure. for one concern. Um, uh, well, two points. One, again, this is a proposal that you've put forward. We're engaged in dialogue, and I'm expressing a commitment on behalf of the city to look at this along with other options as well to make sure that our concerns about unintended consequences uh, are resolved. And I, and I thank you for your willingness to look at the language of your bill um, as part of that process. Um, I, I just want to um, make clear that we are not taking enforcement against people who are operating legally. Um, we receive complaints. If people are operating legally, we don't write violations. If people are operating illegally, we do write violations. And I just, I, I want to be very clear because we see, um, we've seen the content of hearings end up in ECD hearings as people defend these suits that, um, th that if you are the owner of a building, you should seek legal counsel. You should carefully review your certificate of occupancy and, and not um, because it is described as legal and not a priority in a hearing, not think that that means what you're doing is legal and that you are free from enforcement. And I, I understand your point that you don't think they should be, but I just also don't want homeowners to be in a position where they feel like they are acting legally when they're not. Uh, and I accept that, the second point first. Um, the problem I have is that even though we're trying to correct the legality of it, you're still opposed to it, which leads me to believe that you just basically support uh, the way it's written now, and that's a frustrating thing to me that might explain uh, why we've had problems trying to deal with this issue if you actually believe it should be the way it is now, which is what I'm hearing with the opposition. And uh, to your first point, um, yes, we put this forward. Uh, did you have, I may be wrong, but I. Have you had any suggestions of how to deal with this issue since it arose uh, maybe a year or two ago? Uh, we have not put forward any legislative proposals. We felt we've enforced the laws as they are on the books. Thank you. Councilman McCormick. I don't even know where to start, except uh, everything. Obviously, I echo the sentiments of the chair and as a co-prime sponsor. I, I, I don't know if um, it's been brought up, though, the one caveat to this and the uh, bed and breakfast owners is uh, they are actually small business owners and have a classification with the Department of Finance that supports that. So there's a tremendous mixed message that's being sent where they're being taxed at a rate as a small business and not uh, able to opt. And then, you know, we turn around and don't allow them to operate their business. Um, I was told personally in several meetings with your office that the, the way the enforcement would be done was directed at the most egregious actors. We've had small business owners who have had one or two complaints, 311 complaints, who have had the entire, who have bared the brunt of the entire task force on their, on their homes and establishments. And I think that that's directly an opposite of what I was told how this would function. So uh, there's two mixed messages. One, to me in my office, and as the chair of the Committee on Small Business, who represents small businesses and who identifies them as small businesses, as does the Department of Finance, and then to those small business and or homeowners who uh, have a reasonable expectation that they'll be able to operate their businesses unimpeded. That hasn't been the case. And, you, you know, you've chosen to stick to the letter of law when clearly there's a gray area when you have small business owners who have small business certificates, who are, who are registered with the Department of Finance as small businesses and recognized as such and who are in compliant with their tax obligation, who are now being uh, treated as though uh, it's foreign what they're, what they're doing. So in, in, uh, in, as we're waiting for, uh, like the chair mentioned, uh, the ability to change the zoning, I think that the enforcement should be done to those egregious actors as you've identified them and not to these small business owners. I, I'm just wondering how you can stick so stringently to the law when there is clearly a gray area in this case as it relates to this demographic. Uh, I also don't know where to start on that. I, we, 
uh, you know, as we've said before, there are a variety of laws and we are holding people accountable to it. These aren't new laws. These are laws that have been on the books for decades. Um, and you know, I understand um, I understand the goals of what you're trying to say, and that's why we are happy to continue a conversation that looks at all forms of transient lodging and how they are regulated and how there is interplay. Um, I don't think that um, I don't think that one simple fix dedicated at one simple audience uh, is the appropriate way to start, as I said in my testimony, but we are happy to continue that conversation to figure it out uh, on all levels. I just want to say that when we began this conversation two years or maybe a year and a half ago, um, my ask as the chair of small business was for a carve out for business owners. So you, you, you keep referring to this broad application of the law as it relates to all uh, uh, residences and we would not be here at the table with this piece of legislation had you been willing to do a carve out to give a concession to small business owners in two and under who are who's a very specific niche in the market and who again operate as small businesses are in compliance with the law as it relates to a, the small business that they operate and the department of finance i don't see how it's not clear that this is a different demographic i realize that you you know you don't want to for whatever reason uh, use a wide brush to identify the needs of this particular constituency, but it would have been very easy not to have this argument at this level had you had some willingness to just do a carve out and then begin to address the needs of the city as it related to them and the needs of the small business. I I'm still not sure how you can be so regimented and consistent in applying the law in this manner when clearly there is not even a great ish area, an area that needs to be identified. And we as a city, um, I'm, I'm always guilty of saying this a thousand times, we as a city can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can apply the law as it relates to safety for, for uh, residents while not crippling small businesses simultaneously. I, I, I promise you we can do that. And this represents uh, an unwillingness on the administration's part to actually do that. So, so I am with the chair a thousand percent in moving forward with the legislation because I don't think that there's been a willingness on the administration's part in this instance to have resolution that was on behalf of small businesses. So I'm, I'm very kind of, I'm, I'm very disappointed that we're still having this same conversation. And as we leave here today, there won't be any concession on your behalf to, you know, kind of rein in uh, uh, the, the, the way that you're doing and applying the law. Even after this hearing, you seem regimented to go out and there's no uh, uh, cert security for these small businesses that you won't be coming after them tomorrow. And by the way, you, know, you, you, you kind of stated in your opening that this wasn't directed at small businesses and this was based on 311, but I, I am pretty sure that the way the enforcement was ramped up, that that was really low hanging fruit because they, they, they haven't hidden they're small businesses. They've, they've done, they've advertised, and those consistently have been targets of enforcement, uh, where other people who behave egregiously across the city uh, have, have been able to escape any level of enforcement. So I'm very disappointed. Well, Councilman, if I could respond, I, you know, I, I don't view this as an argument, and I hope that you've never found me personally argumentative. I, I view it as a conversation that we're having. Not, not to never personally, okay. but, but professionally. Okay. But I don't see it as an argument. I see it as an ongoing conversation that we're continuing today. Um, you know, you, you talked about a carve out, and I, you know, and I've looked at the hearing testimony, and what we had all along committed to was not proactive enforcement in this area, which is we have held true. I have not sent my teams to a bed and breakfast, a business that identifies itself as a bed and breakfast, based on anything other than a 311 complaint. And I'm stating that categorically. When we have conducted these inspections, we have found conditions that raise very serious safety concerns. It isn't just a matter of a small business paying taxes or having the appro re appropriately reporting what the conduct is that they're doing. We are finding conditions where there are several locked rooms with inadequate egress. And I don't, wouldn't want to sit here either saying I chose not to take enforcement action when we saw conditions that impacted on life safety conditions. Uh, and I, and I hope that that's not, I don't, I don't think that's what you're asking, but I, I take very seriously the safety obligations that my office enforces. 
We have Department of Buildings, we have Department of Fire, we have police, and they are all looking at it through a very critical lens. Um, you know, nonetheless, I, I just I want to go back to my, my first point, which is we're happy to continue the conversation. And I, you know, I hear what you're saying, that you feel like we haven't continued it. Uh, and you have every right to say that, but we're here. We're saying we're happy to continue going forward and that we want to look at the wide variety of issues um, affecting not just this one particular small industry that does not have a legal definition. And I, I hope that there's some appreciation that you're asking for me to treat one class of people differently than another class of people with no legal distinction to, to adhere to about what except that the Department of Finance classification as a small business that is a that is a clear okay. distinction I, but I, I with all honesty that's a, that's it's a clear I, I, I beg to differ that's a that's you can't get clearer in terms of the distinction and and that's that is the barometer that I'm using I'm not using a barometer of someone operating in their home I'm I'm here advocating on behalf of the small businesses who are registered as small businesses who are classified with the Department of Finance as small businesses that's a clear differentiation from any other classification that you can mention as it relates to the application of this law. And, but the operation of a business, when you have a residential certificate of occupancy, is a violation of the law. So I cannot be bound by the Department of Finance. I understand that this is complicated. Um, I, I've mentioned in my testimony that this is a complex web of state and local laws. Um, by no means does the fact that someone has told the Department of Finance this is what I am mean that it's legal to do that in the building that they're in any more than a manufacturing build, uh, a manufacturing company couldn't open up in a apartment building or any more than a storefront can open up um, in a residential neighborhood without the appropriate clearances, permits, and zoning variances. I, you know, I, I, I understand you're not satisfied with my answer, but it is, it is not so simple to just say, this place calls themselves a bed and breakfast, you shouldn't enforce there. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, because you were co prime, I gave you some leeway on the time there. Um, but we're going to ask uh, for five minutes on um, any council members uh, after. But, um, I do want to just say that as a city in general, we do make decisions, we have limited resources and we make decisions of when and where we enforce things. That's just clear from uh, anything that we do enforcement on, we can't enforce it all at the same time, we just don't have the resources. And so uh, I think in an act of good faith, there could have been more collaboration of uh, the council making and insisting that these are not who we're trying to enforce on. There could have been more collaboration of how not to have that happen, even if they were three on one calls, particularly if they were registered with DOF and doing everything that they were supposed to do. I just want to be clear that that did not happen. And that's why we're at this point now and why the council has to act. Um, we're going to have a council member Rosenthal uh, do her questions for five minutes. What we're going to do after is we're going to go to um, the, uh, the DOB bill, which is 385B. Um, is that 1307. 1307. So we're going to have, you get a testimony of that. Then we're going to have the panels on those two bills. And then we're going to do the asthma bill, because I know most people here are for the asthma bill. We want to make sure we keep the conversations as coherent as possible. That's just an understanding of what's happening next. Uh, we have Council Member Rosenthal. Now we're in trouble. Um, good to see you. How are you doing, Christian? Thanks for all your work. Did you guys put out the uh, Airbnb hotline number? Was that you guys? It was great. It was announced in the press today. No, that was a coalition of officials and advocates, uh, not oh, us. That's great. Um, and, but the information will get to you. I, I sure hope so. There are follow-up conversations, but we're, you know, we, we're happy to receive complaints and information. That was supposed to be anyone. a happy way of starting off the questioning. Yeah. I didn't mean to. No, that's fine. Uh. Um, so let's just move on. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, Council Member Cornegie leaned over and jokingly said, this is all my fault. And um, I get that because, um, you know, we have this much bigger issue of um, Airbnb not being a responsible corporate player and allowing people to illegally, um, you know, knowingly break the law on their website. 
I'm wondering, can I explore a little bit more about the cases um, where it was a bed and breakfast, where you sent in folks? Um, how many of those have there been? Do you have a sense how many bed and breakfasts? Um, I, I can't say definitively. One to five, five to ten? I, I can say anecdotally, right? We don't track it because there's not a legal definition. We're not tracking it as a bed and breakfast. We're only tracking based on what we find. Anecdotally, I know of in my time as director, um, which spanned from 10 days before the last time I was in front of this committee until today, about a year and a half, of okay. three businesses. About three. Have identified That's okay. I'm not, this, none that. of these are trick questions. It's, it's I really okay. I just want to give okay. the full context. Um, so about three. Mm -hmm. And in those three, what have been the nature of the violations? And the reason I ask is because it strikes me, you know, the idea that there's a locked room with no second egress. That's a problem. Um, so what I'm getting at is uh, it's good that you were there to make sure that people are safe. Um, what were the nature of the violations that would be normal safety violations had those agencies come in and inspected? And then did they, on top of it, get the illegal hotel violation? Um, if you mean by illegal hotel violation, you're talking about the 210.3 yeah. provided by local law 45. Okay. So um, I, if I get into too much detail, please cut me off because this is very I will. technical. Um, generally, the nature of the violations of the three that we went to, we issued violations in two, um, and they centered around the illegal transient use at a level and in a physical, um, the way that the uh, building was physically arranged constituted a conversion to single room occupancy, which is a, a, essentially a de facto multiple dwelling, which then triggers a number of other safety uh, requirements, such as adequate egress, sprinklers, fire alarms. Um, and in those two, uh, one of them engaged in immediate correction. We sent our teams out as soon as they said, we've, we've fixed it, they, they had taken all the locks off the doors, which is a key component. You cannot have external locks on guest room doors. Um, and we immediately lifted the vacate so that they could go back in. And th they reported to us, and subsequent inspection confirmed that they were no longer operating illegally. Um, one remains vacated, uh, and the other, there was, based on our investigation, there wasn't adequate uh, information. But no about. longer, let's go back to the one that cured all the violations. Are they operating as a B&B? &B? Well, from my understanding is that they are having paid rumors and boarders and limiting it to two. They have what? They are having paid guests and limiting it to two so they can stay within the confines of the Oh, law. I see. Um, I mean, it just strikes me, especially because it's only three, that um, first of all, you can do an easy search about whether or not this is, you could just look on the Department of Finance Right, you could do a search and see that they, is that right? And see that they're a small business. I mean, I, I'm with you a thousand percent on the safety violations, um, but I hear about, you know, what are we going to do for people who, you know, are, this is how they're using their home. Um, they're operating it as a small business. I don't know. Well, and then I want to do want to respond to the second part of your question about the illegal hotel. So that violation is for uh, that violation in particular only pertains to multiple dwellings. And I think part of the miscommunication has been that in the past our offices agreed that the multiple dwellings law does not apply to one or two family homes. But I think that was misconstrued to imply that one or two family homes are then free to do whatever they want, even though there's another law that governs multiple dwellings. I mean, that's not the case, right? One or two family homes have to do what the law involving one or two family homes have to do. I see. And before that law was created, um, not as new law, but to clarify a long-standing, decades long-standing understanding of uh, permanent residency by the city, um, it had always been illegal to convert your occupancy to something other than what the certificate of occupancy says. It has always been legal or illegal? Illegal, mm -hmm. going back decades to change what you were legally allowed to use. Um, and then in particular, um, for one of the two places where we issued violations, 
the, the search of the finance wouldn't have done it because they are actually paying taxes not as a business to finance, but the classification is as a one or two family home. And so we wouldn't necessarily have known. But the point is, no matter how it gets reported to 311, we don't hold, we don't hold the public to understand, it, you know, the complex legal web is difficult for us, and we think about this stuff a lot. Um, I don't. I would never hold a 311 caller to a precise understanding of the law. If they call it a bed and breakfast, if they call it a hotel, whatever it is, I don't think that they're saying it's actually one thing or another. They're just saying, I have a problem with what's happening on my block, in my community. This is disrupting my quality of life. Please help. And we go and we look for compliance and we hold people accountable to the law. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, I'm hoping to uh, still push this bill forward. If there's other language you'd like us to entertain, uh, please let us know. But I think what's become clear to me is that there seems to be a philosophical difference of whether or not one or two family owners should be able to do this. And I didn't fully understand that before, but that's what explains, I think, why there wasn't the collaboration uh, that we were seeking. And we should discuss that further. But uh, we do have a problem with people who are uh, being ag uh, aggrieved currently, and we need to do something to assist them, and my hope is that we uh, will move forward expeditiously with doing that. Oh, which one? Oh. Uh, just two questions on it. Uh, how many violations were issued to one or two family private dwellings as bed and breakfast in 2016? Uh, I can't answer that because we don't issue violations as a bed and breakfast. Do you use your breaks? So I can. I, you don't keep track can, of that one. We can provide family? information on how many violations we've issued in one or two family settings. Sorry. We could provide information on how many one or two family dwellings we've issued violations in. I would say ballpark about a hundred in the past two years. About a hundred uh, in the past two years. Two years, and mm -hmm. we can uh, we can follow up with you to give you more specific data. But again, we don't track it based on how they report or consider themselves okay. when there's not a legal definition for that. And what were the nature of violations issued to one to family private dwellings? Um, occupancy contrary to the certificate of occupancy, creating um, more units of housing than are actually allowed by the certificate of occupancy, inadequate egress, inadequate sprinklers, inadequate fire safety alarms, um, and uh, often work without a permit. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, look forward to continuing the conversation. Uh, I think too. we're going to have the testimony on 1307. Or 13. Good morning, Chair Williams and members of the Housing and Building Committee. I'm Sharon Neal, Deputy Commissioner for Finance and Administration at the New York City Department of Buildings. I am joined by Assistant Commissioner for External Affairs, Patrick Whaley. We are pleased to be here today to offer testimony on intro number 1307A, which broadens the qualifications to become an inspector at the department. As this committee is well aware, the department is charged with the regulation of more than 1 million buildings and approximately 45,000 active construction sites at any one point in time. Inspections serve as an essential function for ensuring construction is performed in a safe and co-compliant manner, that non-compliant and unsafe construction is stopped, and that appropriate enforcement is executed. The department performed nearly 325,000 inspections last year. The types of inspections we perform are numerous and vary greatly. There are those that require significant technical knowledge of our codes, and relate, relate to high-risk work, such as cranes, supported excavation, demolition, and gas piping. Alternatively, there are tens of thousands of inspections we perform each year that are simpler and more administrative in nature. This would include inspections of curb cuts, decks, and fencing, and checking on the status of vacate and stop work orders. With the support of the administration and the City Council, the department has been the beneficiary of much needed additional resources to bolster our inspector ranks. The department's budgeted headcount has increased to 554 positions for fiscal year 2018, a 49% increase from fiscal year 2014. Additional resources to hire inspectors helps only to the extent that you can actually hire them. The department continuously faces significant challenges with the recruitment and retention of inspectors. The reason for this are twofold. 
First is the fact that we compete with the construction industry for the same skilled trade workers, and the salaries the private sector provides are more competitive than the city can offer, particularly during periods of surging development as we are in now. Second is the fact that the city charter impedes our ability to pull from the widest pool of available and qualified ta talent, which brings us to the bill before this committee. Currently, the qualifications to become an inspector are set forth in the city charter. The department is the only city agency whose qualifications for inspectors are set in the law. All other agencies with inspectors have the authority to determine the appropriate qualifications in consultation with the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. The qualifications to become an inspector are essentially five years experience working in a construction trade. As an alternative, a combination of five years experience in a construction trade and training or education in a construction program or an apprentice inspection program also qualifies someone to become an inspector. Additionally, licensed architects and engineers are qualified to become an inspector. The qualifications set for in the, ch in this, in the charter are limited and outdated, do not meet the department's needs, and greatly impede our ability to cast as wide a net as possible to hire qualified inspectors. The qualifications do not allow for the flexibility to consider candidates for inspector who have a variety of education and experience that should qualify them to work at the department, but disqualify them from consideration because of the qualifications set in the law. Furthermore, the department's mandate has broadened over time with a focus on more var varied disciplines such as sustainability. Some examples of education that the department cannot consider without the additional qualifications set forth in the charter include applicants with degrees in engineering, engineering technology, architecture, and architecture technology. Intro 1307A would allow us to consider more types of education and experience. Additionally, as mentioned earlier, the inspections we perform vary greatly in terms of complexity and risk. We perform tens of thousands of inspections a year that are routine and administrative in nature that should not require five years of experience in a construction trade to perform. Intro 1307A reduces the experience threshold from five years to two years, and in, do, in doing so provides us with the necessary flexibility to determine the appropriate amount of experience required to perform particular types of inspections. From a workforce development perspective, Intro 1307A has additional benefits. By enabling the department to determine qualifications appropriate to the work being performed, we can attract a more diverse workforce who otherwise, <clears throat> who otherwise might not get a foothold in our ranks and bring them into well-paying careers with excellent pension and service to our city. The department is committed to building a diverse workforce and intro 1307A will enable them, will enable us to work with partners like CUNY to connect low income New Yorkers to career pathways working for the city. Furthermore, doing so will allow us to provide them with the training and experience that will groom them into more senior and better paying positions within the department. By broadening the talent pool, the department will be able to provide pathways to a stable career with family supporting wages for more New Yorkers. The department now provides a level of training for our inspectors that is well beyond what the drafters of the charter language contemplated. As part of what we call Buildings University, we have an academy for new inspectors now in its fifth year, which provides rigorous training over 12 weeks, both in the classroom and out in the field. Just as the scale and complexity of construction and the law that regulates it is continuously evolves, so too must the qualification for inspectors. For this reason, the department should be treated more like other city agencies and be provided with the flexibility to determine the qualifications to become an inspector. This committee is quite familiar with the recent increase in construction accidents throughout the city, and the department has appreciated the opportunity to work with the council to address this issue as we continue to do more. Currently, one of the many strategies to improve safety on construction site is through effective enforcement. 
Intro 1307A will give us the ability to hire more inspectors more quickly, which means performing more inspections more quickly and more effectively advancing our public safety mission. Thank you for your attention and the opportunity to testify you before you today. We welcome any questions you may have. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony. I uh, just have a couple questions. I know Councilman Rosenthal does. Oh, Godentrick does as well. So we'll do Councilman Godentrick and Rosenthal. If proposed intro number 1307 would have passed as is, how many DOS, DOB inspectors do you anticipate that you will be able to hire? And how would intro number 1307 impact DOB's budget? So currently, um, we can only hire what we're authorized to be um, our budgeted headcount. So right now, I have 40 vacancies. The vacancy rate will increase next year because our authorized budgeted headcount will go up. So we would anticipate that we'll be able to, to hire quicker because we'll have a more larger qualified pool of people to pull from. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Grodentic and Council Member Rosenthal, five minutes each. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Neal, in your testimony, it seemed to me, um, and maybe I'm wrong, but it seemed to me you're almost suggesting two tiers of inspectors here that some would take the more complicated tier and uh, the more complicated issues and some would take the more routine issues. Is that the intent of this legislation or is that the intent of DOB? The, the intention would be to provide a, a more rational workforce development approach. So right now our minimum qualification is this combination of five years. Some of the people that we hire now may have more than that so they, they actually come in with more experience and education than some of them that have the minimum and we try to align the work that we have with those people who are the best qualified to do the work that we need. What we're anticipating is that by lowering the threshold, it'll give us a better pipeline, which obviously would need to be um, supported with education and, and a career path going forward. But yes, for some, for people who potentially would have less experience and education, we would assign them to less complicated inspections initially. Is, as that, they, is that written into the law as proposed by the mayor's office? <coughs> I'm no. concerned that this is a very complex city. We have seen some spectacular disasters over the last few years, especially with regard to gas leaks. Um, obviously, um, I am not an expert, but we do need to have people who are experts out there inspecting. And I am concerned that the wrong person would be assigned to the wrong job. And I don't really think that in a city as complex as New York, we should be looking to lower our standards. It would not be the department's intention to assign less experienced inspectors to do high-risk inspections. I mean, before I can vote on this legislation, I would need some kind of safeguards written into the law to uh, ensure that that doesn't happen. Um, The, at the top of page three, you, you said that the qualifications that are set forth in the charter are limited and outdated. Outdated in what way? So basically, we are not able to update the job spec to incorporate other types of educational disciplines. So the only um, de conferred degree from, a, from a, a higher ed institution, we would not be able to hire people who have associate degrees in um, engineering technology or architectural technology who may be well suited to have competencies to read plans, to understand field conditions, reconcile those uh, situations um, between what the code is outlining and, and what's occurring in the field. It, it impedes, it, it, it prevents us from updating the job spec to include a, a larger breadth of variety of talent that's being educated or even in the field being um, in related in, in construction disciplines, not specifically to skilled trades. So if, this, if this bill were passed, would they still need to have, they would still need to have two years of experience anyway, right? So yes. it wouldn't be like you could hire them right out of college. No. Okay. And if I may oh. add, yes, uh, council member, <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Uh, there's, uh, you know, with the council's help, um, 
this city has an energy code that we all can be proud of, and we've worked very hard to strengthen that code. And with that code comes enhanced enforcement to ensure that buildings throughout the city are sustainable, energy, energy efficient, and that the city is meeting its 80 by 50 goal. We need to hire inspectors who have expertise in the energy code who can perform that enforcement and to do those reviews. And so, so currently today, if there are individuals out there who have degrees in you know, ener engineering technology, engineering management, renewable energy, these are folks with degrees that we don't have the ability to pull from to hire as inspectors to do this important work. So that's an, a more specific example of sort of how we're impeded in our hiring. Uh, last question, Mr. Chair. Um, starting salary for building inspectors in the city of New York? And, and what's the salary after five years? So we actually, um, the salary ranges are dictated by the, the collective bargaining agreements. I appreciate that. Um, our, appreciate it. Also, don't have to live with it, but go with it. So our, our intro, basically like our base field inspector, the, yes. the min max um, is 49,862, and it goes up to 72,836. Okay. Then the next the next title is an associate title, and that range has two levels. But the overall um, range between the two titles, uh, two levels, is uh, sixty five seven ninety three, and it goes up to eighty nine oh six two. Um, I do want to clarify that um, a response to your previous questions, we we would be seeking to potentially hire people who have it either education or experience of two years. So if somebody did graduate with a four-year engineer or architect degree, we would seek to hire them. We realize that we're going to have to change probably more uh, on the job training to supplement that educational training that those candidates have. Well, those I'll people would have no experience, though, on the job. They just, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I just yep. wanted Thank you, Council Member. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Sure, Councilmember Rosenthal. Are we also joined by Councilmember Ulrich and Levine? Um, I, thank you. I, I, I'm supportive of the idea because I know what a challenge it's been to find people and retain um, really good staff for Department of Buildings. You're sort of competing with a private sector that, um, you know, has a lot of money. I guess. What I would wonder is, is there a way in the rewrite of the law to have defined titles with um, defined responsibilities, or maybe that already exists? I mean, is it clear that these people would be doing, you know, not complex um, things. I mean, so we're just trying to preempt a situation where DOB is really short-staffed and ends up sending someone, you know, not prepared in to do uh, an inspection or something. I don't know. So that, that's actually what the process is with the job specification process. Right now we are prevented from updating the job spec because the charter is outlining what the minimums are. But the intention would be is to incorporate typical tasks and duties that would, would be outlined in the job spec. And that's what we're seeking to have some flexibility with is because as the industry changes over time and as education and disciplines evolve over time, we want to have some ability to update the job spec, which in and of itself isn't a super quick process either because we actually have to go through DCAS, who ends up consulting and um, vets those changes as Sounds well. horrible. And that also need to go through um, the Office of Labor Relations. So it's not something that the department can unilaterally decide in a vacuum. It is, there is additional city oversight to that process. Okay. So I see. So you're changing the minimum requirement in the charter. Right. And then do, oh, I see. God bless you for the work you do. Uh, okay, I got it. Thank you. I support this bill. Could you add my name to it? Thank you. Uh, Council Member Cornegie. I'm going to pass. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. I'll pass. Uh, thank you very much.
Uh, so what we're going to do now is have a – thank you so much for the testimony. Thank you. Um, have the, and I, obviously I support this. Uh, uh, my name is on it. I think what we're trying to do is what we do for other agencies, provide a framework uh, in which the, uh, the building department will be able to flesh out, as you mentioned, some more specifications uh, so we can get these vacancies filled up. So I appreciate the opportunity to assist with that. We're going to have the panels. So it turns out that these – conversations on these two bills were a lot denser than I thought they would be, and so I want to try to move this forward so we can get to the anticipated uh, asthma bill. So I am going to try something. Hopefully it works with not too much bloodshed. I'm going to call up uh, the pro and con at the same time uh, for each bill. Uh, we're going to do uh, 1589. Uh, so we have uh, Monique Greenwood, 347 McDonough Street, Donald Madison, uh, 15 Prospect Park West, uh, Liz Madarano, 7 Arlington Place, Maury Cox, 492 Macon Street, Marty Wethman, MFY Legal, John Furlong, Housing Conservation Coordinator. If they can all come up, please. I know some of these folks, so I know it's going to be done in a very civil manner. <laughs> I'm going to. Yeah, that's good. We're going we're gonna to try the same thing with 1307 based on the success of this panel. So you guys have a lot on your shoulders. Here. Money Greenwood. Yes. Good Donald, morning. Donald Madison. Here. Liz Monarano. Here. Maury Cox. Marty Wyffen. And John Furlong. Here. I, I think we need one more. There's another chair over here. Right. Oh, we need uh, one more. Yeah. Two minutes. Thank you. Um, sorry, what? Can you all please each raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Uh, you each have uh, two minutes to give your testimony. I usually say you can start in order of your preference, but if we could do maybe all the pros first uh, and then the cons, uh, we'll do it that way. Uh, before we move forward, we've been joined by ambassadors and sneakers. A Young Leaders Transatlantic Summer Academy on Human Rights. Half of the students from Germany and the other half are from Georgia. Greetings, everyone. Welcome. You enjoying yourself? Is it all you ever hoped and dreamed? Thank you very much for joining us. You can start your testimony. Good morning. My name is Monique Greenwood, and I am the owner of Aquaba Bed and Breakfast Inns in Bedford Stuyvesant, in Brooklyn. Uh, let me first thank the council members, Jamani Williams and Robert Carnegie Jr. Because about a year and a half ago, we were in this room to share how we, traditional bed and breakfast, were being negatively impacted by legislation and enforcement directed at illegal Airbnbs. It was clear then that the council members present at the hearing understood our plight, and we, would assur we were assured that something would be done to protect us. And here we are today with proposed legislation that would at least allow us to operate on a minimal basis without the constant worry of the Mayor's Office of Special Enforcement showing up to shut us down. Traditional B&Bs, like those who are part of our organization, the New York City Bed and Breakfast Association, are owner-occupied single and two-family residences where we welcome travelers on vacation and, more likely, those that are coming to visit with family and friends who live within walking distance of our ends. They live with us, never alone, and our private homes 
aren't apartment buildings with units that could be leased to tenants on a full-time basis. Therefore, we don't deny the city of much needed affordable apartment rentals, and we don't disturb other residents within the dwelling with the comings and goings of unknown individuals. We are the only other occupants, and we are hosting our guests who often become like family. I should also add that we have proper insurances for the type of um, occupancy that we have, and we are inspected by those insurance agencies. Now, this is a modest living, and aside from the joy of meeting new people and creating special memories, many of us do it to supplement our income so we can afford to keep up with the cost of living in a large, historic, single-family home. So we opened 22 years ago with this goal. We love what we do. Our daughter was raised there. We've been named Small Business of the Year twice under two previous mayors. We won Hotel Showdown, a travel channel show, where we beat out big hotels because of our personal sentences. touch. Thank you. So basically, I just want to close by saying everything that was mentioned, we are in compliance with. We do not take away affordable housing. We live Thank with you. our neighbor, with our guest, and the only real locks are the doors that are to the property, and maybe we lock our bedroom doors, and some people do that in their homes even if they don't Thank have guests. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Don Madison, and I opened doors uh, in 2008 to serve my neighbors and their families at a time when there were very few local lodging options for parents and grandparents <laughs> coming to visit that did not involve a cab or a subway ride to and from their loved ones' homes. Most of our guests are regular customers and consider our home as their own home while they are in Brooklyn for a few days or a week while visiting family. They want to be close to family and prefer a B&B experience to hotels. Most of these people I now consider friends. Their children and grandchildren know and love our home, a landmark building on Prospect Park West. We're also a popular alternative for foreign guests who prefer more than a generic hotel experience. And I mean no offense to those who prefer to stay in a Holiday Inn Express or a Super 8 motel. We host guests from all corners of the world who want to see New York and Brooklyn through the lens of local residents staying in residential neighborhoods, in home settings, eating and shopping where we eat and shop. We have been honored by foreign magazines and newspapers listed as among the top 10 boutique accommodations in New York. We have dozens of testimonials from guests which will give you a very clear idea of the breadth and scope of our services. New York City's B&Bs are much more than a place to sleep. We are a valuable community resource. In Brooklyn in particular, we, hope, uh, we host families in town to help new moms attend christenings, bat mitzvahs, graduations, weddings, birthdays, celebrate Brooklyn concerts in Prospect Park, Barclays Center events, and more than six wedding venues within walking distance of our home. We generously support local cultural institutions, including Prospect Park, the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, the Brooklyn Museum, and the Brooklyn Academy of Music, both financially and by providing free and discounted accommodations for their speakers, professional consultants, and job applicants. We generate economic activity for our local restaurants and shops where our guests go to dine and entertain. In short, not only do our guests love us, but so do local businesses that reap the economic benefits of tourism we bring to the neighborhood. This, our association, which I co-chair with Ms. Greenwood, wants to promote the understanding that B&Bs are a vital part of the economic and social fabric of the communities we serve and to distinguish what we do from other short-term rental practices, which some apartment owners engage in, activities illegal under New York's multifamily dwelling laws. On a local level, I'm going to have to give you, ask you to give a closing sentence. Sure. On a local level, our economic contributions are significant. Our guests spend most of their time and money in local neighborhoods. These guests spend hundreds of dollars at locally owned and operated businesses. All the money they spend goes into the pockets of our talented local neighbors, not to shareholders of national chains traded on Wall Street. Brooklyn is a global beacon for artisanal products and services, and we are a part of that fabric. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Liz Mandurano. About two and a half years ago, I spoke before you when I was restoring a bed brownstone to its original glory. Nine months after that hearing, I completed my two and a half year restoration in September 2015 and proudly opened Arlington Place Bed and, Bre bed and Breakfast. 
Um, my home has always been a one-family home, and like many homeowners interested in added security, I put locks on the bedroom doors. Notably, the bedroom door locks were present when the DOB came and certified my house for occupancy as a single-family home at the end of the restoration. Contemporaneous with the publicity surrounding my opening, because my house um, was the Crooklyn house, um, was a purported 311 complaint written in precise legal language. Um, Eleven months after this complaint, in September 2016, the DOB came um, to the house for a second time. Not surprisingly, there had been no additional 311 complaints in that entire year as I operated mindfully and respectfully. When the DOB arrived, my co-innkeeper refused them entry and showed them a letter um, authored by council members Cornegie and Williams asking them not to harass me. The investigator left, but to my shock later that day, a six-member squad team raided my place with an emergency issued warrant. At that time, I was picking up my son from school. They kicked my co-innkeeper out of the house, and although 11 months had passed since the complaint, placed an order to vacate sign on the door stating that my house was quote unquote, an imminent threat to life. I was not allowed back in my house, and I was advised that if I attempted to enter my home, I would be arrested. Although the director conceded at an emergency meeting that the law was murky, the OSE took the absurd position that the locks on the four bedroom doors, which had been certified as a single family home by the DOB upon inspection, um, that it was converted into a five unit SRO with the fifth unit being the remainder of my house, not even a bedroom. As a result, although clearly there was no intention to create an SRO and the DOB had inspected and approved of it beforehand, the OSE was able to deem my one family home subject to commercial zoning codes and issued a multitude of violations that ranged from a lack of sprinkler systems to me having propane for my barbecue. I'm gonna have to ask you to give a closing sentence, please. Okay. Um, how, the city should not stretch laws to absurd conclusions because it's easier to pursue us as targets due to our transparency. Um, as was the case prior to January 2015, where Airbnb refused to provide addresses, I was pursued as low-hanging fruit. Um, many in my um, association were deeply affected by this experience, and I'm very fortunate that I did not lose my home because I had to pay in legal fees and incidentals over in six figures, above six figures. Thank you. Um, but what I wanted to say as one last statement was that we respectfully ask you in this law to include a provision for one family homes that bedroom locks do not automatically convert places into SROs. Thank you. Thank you. You can chair, did someone from the administration stay? There's people from the administration here. Yeah. And perhaps in the back. Good morning. My name is Marty Weifman. I'm a supervising attorney at MFY Legal Services. Um, we've been working on this issue as advocates for well over a decade, and, and the issue of illegal short-term rentals in New York City is very complex and nuanced, um, and it's one that we've seen grown exponentially since the early 2000s. Um, we at MFY are sympathetic to the small business owners who are operating bed and breakfasts. Um, lawfully, and however, it is a legal fiction, bed and breakfasts, as has been raised by the administration earlier. Um, and so while they're paying taxes and, and operating in this way, it's not something that is, is lawfully classified. Um, so we are open to working with city council to find a way to, to lawfully create a classification um, for this very defined uh, universe of one and two family homes. Um, we are very concerned about intro 1589. We appreciate the chair's remarks opening up wanting to limit it to one and two family homes. Um, however, we are concerned still about the unintended qu consequences, um, particularly the, the housing stock that this provides to many poor and low income New Yorkers. Um, we at MFY work with many um, aging adults who aren't yet seniors, so they don't qualify for SCREE. Um, and if they're priced out of their homes or if they're evicted for some other reason, uh, this is the type of housing that they need. They need to find shared apartments or 
you know, living in, in a unit in a one and two family home. Um, this is very, this is critical housing for, for this type of, for this population. Um, so we are very concerned about that. We are, are also concerned about this, the, these buildings being used transiently. Um, it does drive up the cost of, of rents in, in our communities. And I would refer you to Murray Cox, who's testifying today in the, in the data and the trends that he um, documents on this issue. Thank you. Um, good morning, my name is Murray Cox and I'm the founder of a project called Inside Airbnb, uh, which provides public data on the impact uh, that Airbnb has on residential communities around the world. Um, I'm here today to oppose the proposed bill, uh, uh, intro 1589, on the basis that it will further legitimize and incentivize the rental of residentially zoned rooms and, and homes to tourists instead of New Yorkers. Um, both of the sponsoring council members had said publicly that the, the intent is to limit this to legitimate bed and breakfast. Um, so s some of those uh, people are here today. In 2014, a spokesperson for a, a bed and breakfast trade group. I'm, I'm sorry, I could, I could barely hear your testimony. Okay. Uh, in 2014, a spokesperson for a B&B &B trade group said that there were as few as 16 legitimate bed and breakfasts in New York City. Some other people said 50. In comparison, as of June 2017 this month, there are 19,806 single rooms available on Airbnb, as well as 20,215 entire apartment listings. Um, so when we think about uh, this law as, as it's written, how would it differentiate between the legitimate bed and breakfast with over 40,000 uh, Airbnbs? Um, uh, in fact, out of the, the 19,000 private rooms being offered on Airbnb, Almost one third of them are offered by hosts that have two or more rooms. So they're already uh, breaking this law even before the law changes from uh, two borders to four borders. Um, how many residential units will be caught up in this net that the law casts? Um, the council, council member Williams has already said that they were limited to one and two family homes. There's 860,000 residential units in one and two bedroom homes in New York City. So this, this law could potentially expose those residential units um, up to uh, four tourists and in each unit. Um, so I encourage this committee to reject this bill and instead engage in a, a ULERP to create a limited lawful classification of the bed and breakfast. Um, and in the meantime, the city should continue to enforce against um, illegal rentals um, by people using Airbnb. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for the members of the council for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Jonathan Furlong. I'm the director of organizing at Housing Conservation Coordinators. And I'm here to give testimony on uh, intro 1589. I just want to be clear, um, you know, in opening my testimony that the coalition fully supports the protection of small business owners who have registered their private homes for use as bed and breakfast accommodations, but not at the expense of diminishing an already dwindling number of housing units uh, that could be used to house tenants. If the, intent, if the intended purpose of the bill is to protect B&Bs operating lawfully as small business owners that are licensed by the city, it should be much more, much more narrowly tailored. Currently, there is nothing in the zoning text that designates the classification of B&Bs, and the legislation circumvents the EULA process in many such zoning regulations. We are calling on this committee to take the necessary steps to create a lawful uh, uh, excuse me, classification of B&Bs, which would be the preferred route, as it could include a registration process and requirements for becoming a B&B. &B. This would accomplish the intended purpose behind Intro 1589 and avoid the unintended consequences created by the legislation. Um, and taking some of these things into consideration, it would be useful to know how many bed and breakfasts, as Marie uh, posed the question, uh, are registered as such, where they're located, and it could really guide the conversation around the size and scope within the small business community this bill is intended to protect. And then also just to sort of reiterate what Marty was saying, are, you know, we have really, really serious concerns about this bill sort of diluting a section of the housing market that's roommate driven. Uh, sort of in a city that's constantly in, in, a, in affordable housing crisis, smaller buildings are really uh, more and more in demand uh, and, and the, the units within them. And there's really a dearth of affordable apartments and rooms. And this policy could eliminate, uh, limit the options for neighborhood residents uh, and really should be scrutinized uh, as it's, uh, you know, a section of the housing markets that utilized by, by lower income New Yorkers. Um, and then just as a closing remark, again, like the small business 
classification is a DOF classification. It's not a, you know, it doesn't fall anywhere in housing and buildings. So we just need to, there needs to be a middle way. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you all for the testimony and the work you do. Uh, we're generally on the same side of all these issues, and I, I appreciate that we'll continue to do so. The last point is, is part of the confusion. Uh, one part of the city says it's legitimate, the other part of the city uh, is not. Um, truth be told, most fo folks think I have uh, mostly renters in my district. I actually have mostly one or two family homeowners. Uh, and they do provide a lot of housing, so I understand that. What we have to do is try our best to measure and give everybody space and limited resources that we have. Uh, folks know where I stand with Airbnb and affordable housing, so I don't want to do anything that diminishes that. Uh, but the city has done nothing to work with us to protect the folks that you heard today. Uh, I agree that ULERP and a zoning change would be the best way to do that. What we need to do is find a stopgap while we're doing that, because the city, if the city would say they will stop enforcing folks who will sign up with DOF, um, then we have a stopgap, but they won't do that. And so we have to use whatever we can. And so this is a tool that we came up with. If there's language that you feel will help uh, make it better, uh, stronger, so that we don't lose uh, unintended uh, housing, I'm happy to do that as well. I'm happy to also, as one of the uh, primes, to say when we hopefully start and complete the zoning, to relook at this, uh, and maybe it's not necessary once we do that. But we do have to try to find some relief uh, for the people that we heard today, and there are others out there. But, um, I also, I think it could take some off the market. I'm not sure that uh, people necessarily want to go into the, the business just because the possibilities there. So I don't know if it will be as uh, widespread as we think, but there is a possibility that we can, we can lose some, and I don't want to do that. So any assistance uh, moving forward uh, will be helpful. I do appreciate and uh, thank you for the data. It's helpful to look at that. But I uh, just want to obviously be clear, even if you're in a, an apartment now, if you live in the apartment, you can still use uh, the platform. Rent regulation aside, you know, how you parse out the rent, uh, but there is a, an ability to do that. And all of these folks are also uh, owner occupied as well. So we are trying to balance everything and I appreciate the testimony and any support moving forward. Any other questions? Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you uh, for your testimony. We do have a slight change. Again, th these conversations got a lot more dense than I thought they would uh, at this time. Um, we're going to uh, call back a HPD to give their testimony on the asthma bill. So I apologize for those who are waiting to give a testimony on 1307. Uh, we're going to have a hearing. We're going to hear this testimony. Um, then we're going to go to questions. Then we're going to hear all the panels. I appreciate everybody's patience on these uh, very dense conversations that we've been having. Uh, can everybody please raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Uh, you can begin testimony. If everyone can be uh, a little quieter as we're exiting. Good morning, Chairman Williams and members of the New York City Council Committee on Housing and Buildings. My name is Vito Mustachulo, and I am the Deputy Commissioner for the Office of Enforcement and Neighborhood Services with the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. At the table with me today are Christy Andrea and Deb Nagan, colleagues from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and Assistant Commissioner Marti from HPD. Uh, the, the DOH colleagues will also be here uh, for questions at the conclusion of this testimony. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on intro 385B, which outlines new requirements related to mold and pest remediation. HPD and DOH 
work closely every day to improve housing conditions and the overall health of all New Yorkers. On issues such as lead-based paint, window guards, and bed bugs, the two agencies work collaboratively with each other and with the council to make New York City homes safer and more habitable through enforcement, education, and loan and grant programs. We work closely together on special joint initiatives and on these and other healthy home issues, both in cases of individual buildings and on overall policy issues. For many of these matters, education and early intervention are key components to addressing concerns. Mold and pests are two such areas, and efforts to educate the public and create common sense, fiscally responsible, and high impact preventive measures are supported by both agencies. HPD is grateful for the Council's previous legislation to support this work, most notably the Alternative Enforcement Program and the Underlying Conditions Program, and further appreciate Council Member Mendez's efforts to amend the Housing Maintenance Code with best practices and enhanced enforcement related to mold and pests with proposed intro 385B. We have worked collaboratively with the Council Member and her staff, DOHMH, and stakeholders for more than a year and look forward to continuing those conversations. Before we comment on the specifics of this bill, I would like to provide some background information on both the city's efforts to address asthma and the current processes around mold and pests in residential buildings. DOHMH, in partnership with HPD, NYCHA, and other stakeholders, work to reduce asthma triggers in homes of children with asthma and to promote integrated pest management and other healthy home practices in buildings. These efforts include working with healthcare providers, pest management professionals, affordable housing organizations, and those involved in property ownership, construction, and management to implement building-wide practices and facilitate integrated pest management and other allergen reduction services. DOHMH, again, is here to answer any questions that you may have about these activities. Mold complaints can be reported to HPD via 311. HPD currently issues Class A non-hazardous, Class B hazardous, and Class C immediately hazardous violations for mold based on the severity of the condition. For the past few fiscal years, approximately 40% of all mold violations were issued directly in response to mold complaints. But as evident from the numbers, the majority of violations issued have been upon observation by inspectors. For example, if an inspector is in a building for a complaint related to a broken heater, but also notices the presence of mold, they will issue a violation for mold. In fiscal year 2016, HPD issued a total of 12,718 violations for mold. As of May 31st, 2017, we have issued over 11,500 violations for the current fiscal year. Where appropriate, HPD also issues violations for underlying conditions, such as water leaks, and may also conduct emergency repairs for these conditions should the owner fail to address them. In fiscal year 2016, HPD spent over $750,000 addressing both mold and water leak conditions where the owner failed to correct. In fiscal year 2017, through the end of May, we have spent over $1 million, again, addressing mold and water conditions using licensed mold remediation firms to conduct repairs. In addition to addressing mold as an individual apartment issue, HPD has the authority under Local Law 6 of 2013 to issue orders for underlying conditions throughout a building. As described in rules, HPD has used this authority to issue orders for buildings exhibiting systemic leak issues causing mold in multiple apartments. HPD has selected a total of 203 buildings since the, the beginning of the program. Property owners are required to investigate the cause of a leak or mold condition affecting multiple apartments in a building and correct within four months. HPD has sued non-compliant owners in housing court. The civil penalty as set by law is $1,000 for each dwelling unit with a minimum of $5,000. The good news is that most building owners have complied with the order by both providing HPD with assessment performed by a licensed professional engineer or a registered architect and by correcting all existing violations. HPD has already discharged 106 buildings due to compliance. 23 buildings were subsequently selected for AEP and discharged from the UC program to AEP. The, re the remaining 74 buildings in the program are in the process of compliance or HPD has initiated litigation seeking compliance with the order 
and seeking civil penalties. In five buildings where our housing litigation division has already successfully obtained orders to correct, we have collected over $28,000 in civil penalties. The sections of this bill that require property owners to address water conditions and remove mold in ways that minimize dispersion of mold spores, as well as the sections that increase the seriousness of the conditions, which are not addressed timely, are supported by both agencies. HPD inspectors also respond to 311 complaints regarding roaches and mice. Past violations are currently issued as Class B violations, where an owner has 30 days to correct. HPD issued 20,346 violations in fiscal year 2016 related to pests or vermin. In fiscal year 2017 through the end of March, we issued uh, 21,779 violations uh, for vermin. Under current law, a property owner is required to abate the nuisance of the vermin, but there is little to no guidance about how this should be accomplished. While vermin conditions can, can be complicated by tenant-related access issues or even the denial of access for extermination, there are basic steps that a property owner can and should take to maintain a property which minimizes the spread of pests, including sealing, sealing cracks and holes, as well as addressing leaks. HPD and DOHMH support requiring owners to take these most basic steps. HPD and DOH also support the concept and aim of intro 385B and want to suggest some ways that the current version can be improved. We believe that we can address these concerns over certain requirements through further conversations with the council. For example, under this version of the legislation, pest violations would become a class C violation, imposing a 24 hour repair clock on conducting integrated pest management. Expanding this window to allow conditions to be addressed within 21 days, similar to a mold related class C violation, would be a more reasonable timeline. HPD also has concerns when timeliness for inspection, when timelines for inspections are put into place especially during cold wet weather seasons when workload can vary significantly and HPD's priorities are to inspect for heat and hot water complaints. Additionally, DOHMH would like to continue previous discussions with the council about the terminology and framing of asthma allergens within the bill. DOH looks forward to future conversations with the council about the existing partnership with healthcare providers to address asthma triggers in the homes of children and the most appropriate ways to support that work moving forward. We also believe further discussion and review is needed regarding the costs associated with implementation of the bill in the current environment of the uncertain funding for CDBG, Community Development Block Grant funds, and other federal funding streams, while still ensuring that we are appropriately addressing these concerns. We thank you for the opportunity to share the existing work being done by the administration related to mold and pests and to discuss ways ensuring that all New Yorkers can live in safe and comfortable homes. And we would be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. I'm going to go to the bill sponsor, Councilman Mendez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I'd like to apologize for, to HPD for having to wait an hour and a half to give you testimony, but thank you for being here. And I want to apologize to the public. But after nine years, I guess an hour and a half isn't all that long, right? Um, Vito, can you tell me how long does it take, in, in your experience at HPD, how long has it taken homeowners to cure a mold violation that is uh, A, B, and C for each one of those different categories of violations? So I, I will say that for a Class A violation where the owner has 90 days to correct um, and are addressing very small amounts of mold, um, there is a higher compliance rate um, by the part of the property owner. For a Class B violation where they have 30 days to correct, um, the percentage of correction um, as timely certified actually drops down from the Class A. And then finally for a Class C violation, which under current law only requires a 24-hour response, um, we, we only see a 28% compliance rate. Um, so clearly the uh, intro 385, we believe, that given the existing fr framework and the language, would actually increase uh, owner compliance and correction. Um, you know, what we also face um, are the challenges where the correction is cosmetic, 
Um, and upon reinspection, what we find is a recently painted surface, um, but the actual underlying condition and the cause of the mold was not addressed. Um, so 385 addresses both of those concerns, and, and I believe that it will also increase uh, owner compliance over time. Thank you. Um, you. You read in your testimony some suggestions on changing, making changes uh, to the mold aspect of this bill in terms of giving 21 days uh, to make corrections. Um, some of these, I think, are good things that we could probably incorporate that would make sense to incorporate into the bill. Um, I don't have any further questions at this point, Mr. Chair. Councilman Menchaca. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you for your testimony and for the team for being here. And I also want to thank. Es que decir gracias también por estar aquí. Ya ya sé que es mucho tiempo, pero eso es parte parte del proceso. Um, y, and this is part of the process, and I'm really hoping that your team stays to listen to some of the testimony. There's some really good uh, uh, tr truth to power that I think we all need to listen to. My, my question is really thinking about um, the kind of overall support, and it sounds like this is, this is something that you, you can restate that you are in support of a, a kind of uh, the, the legislation and concept, even with the suggestions that you're offering. Is that right? That is correct. I think it's an important thing for people to hear that the agency, and, and really in partnership with uh, Councilmember Mendez, that we are finally here. So that's an important thing to applaud. The second question is really thinking about the really the, the, the focus points on some of these uh, asthma uh, triggers, and really thinking about the rodents, uh, thinking about um, the mice and the pests. Can you? Br is that something that you can break down as as part of the work that you're doing at HPD uh, and in, in terms of council districts, in terms of demographics? Is that, is that information that you have right now that you collect as an agency? So we are a, a data-rich agency. Um, I have numbers um, broken down by types of vermin. I do not have it by council district, but if you allow us a few days, we can certainly break down the last several fiscal years worth of violations by council district. So that, that's information that you can provide to Absolutely. us? Absolutely. Okay, because I think that's going to be a part of how we, how we can go back to the communities and really engage neighbor, neighborhoods that, that can be uh, contiguous. Um, and I think another important thing to talk about are the kind of violations that you'll be providing us in the council, as council districts uh, about how many, how many of them were multiple incidents within, within the same apartment. What, what, how was that a consistent, was that a consistent narrative within the work that, that you're seeing right now? So just looking at the general numbers, um, we, are <coughs> we are issuing about 20,000 vermin violations a year um, in about 5,000 buildings. Um, and then to break it down by apartments, it's about 6,000 apartments. So we are seeing repeat offenses within a building and repeat offenses within an apartment. And, and re so you're saying repeat, yes, definitely. And, and so tell us a little bit about how, how this bill will help help you articulate it yourself, how, how this bill will help you really bring that enforcement necessary to address some of those repeat incidents. Sure, so I'm gonna start and then I'll hand off to my colleagues at DOH. Uh, I think some of the, uh, the important differences here are is that this intro lays out a remediation guideline. Um, and so as I mentioned in my testimony, uh, we write violations now and there is not much with respect to instructing an owner as to how to properly address the violation. Um, also by allowing 21 days to correct, um, to put into place an integrated pest management plan um, is, a, in my opinion, long term, um, going to see better results than telling an owner they have 24 hours to, to eradicate mice and roaches. Right? And even in the best buildings, that might be difficult. Um, I think, you know, just uh, again, uh, what's important is, um, especially with respect to mold, and I want to thank Councilman Mendez again, uh, to codify mold and to put it into the Housing Maintenance Code um, is a tremendous um, help to the agency. I mean, currently mold is not, very sp is not specifically mentioned in the HMC. Um, so to actually codify it and to put remediation practices in place 
um, is going to really be effective for us in the future. Right, I'll turn it over to DOH. Um, good morning or afternoon. I don't know what we are. Um, so so I, I think the only thing to add to what uh, uh, Vito has said is that I think our experience um, in going into homes um, is that it it's if you if you really want to address a problem and get it fixed and sometimes it's a matter of bringing the plumber in you know fixing the holes getting the if you have to use um, extermination all of those things and you also have to coordinate that with a family a family with very busy lives so rather than just a band-aid that really isn't fixing the problem and then it's going to come back i think just realistically you're talking about you need time to really get that done and get it done in the way that it should be done um, so I think in, in, that, for, for in that instance, relative to the issue of 21 days, it seems like practically that's about the kind of amount of time that you need to do this kind of work because it's coordinating a lot of different things. Thank you for that. And, and I think the, the kind of final question, and before I ask the final question, um, th this is in, in companion, this bill is in companion really to another bill that we've been hearing around mold. Um, out of a different committee and really kind of addressing a standard where there are uh, trained uh, labor force that is really going to uh, address and eradicate some of these issues. So I'm glad that, that we're, we're kind of talking about this as, as a holistic approach with the other, with the mold bill. Um, but the last question I want to leave to all of you is, is how, how are we prepared as a city of New York after we pass this bill to really get the word out to our immigrant communities and making sure that that there's a plan to engage uh, and really empower people to come out. This is going to really require folks to still make those those uh, those complaints uh, and and really drive uh, a kind of new enforcement uh, because the law will will have changed the ability for the for uh, uh, for not the ability but the the requirement for the landlord to respond within the time frame. So tell us a little bit about your response to a, a kind of uh, outreach plan that will hit uh, immigrant communities in our city. So I will start and then again hand off to Al. Um, so for HPD, um, you know, as you know, sir, tomorrow in your district we are hosting summer hours. Thank you for um, that, by the way. No, thank you. Thank you for your uh, cooperation with us um, and to Chair Williams uh, for supporting this. Um, it's a new initiative. Um, it's us bringing our resources to the council district offices where we can sit down with property owners and with tenants and talk about new legislative proposals, to talk about existing laws. Um, so for us, it's also helpful to get feedback from the community. Um, also this summer, and, and unfortunately it may be later in the summer, um, we will have um, several community outreach vans Right, that we will be using for purposes such as disseminating information in, in neighborhoods that it's difficult for tenants and property owners to get to our office um, or for us to get to them. Um, so we're, we're, we're purchasing um, several vans uh, and we will be using them for, um, for outreach programs similar to this. We also have the ability to do robocalls. Right? So we can use um, information from our multiple dwelling registration database to call property owners. Um, so we will be putting messages um, on, through, on robocalls. And to the extent that we can reach out to tenants using um, information that they've provided for complaints, we'd like to try to do the same thing. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, uh, HPD, for, uh, for your testimony. Uh, we do have some uh, additional questions that we'll send to you. Uh, again, uh, just we apologize to you and the, actually and the sponsor and the, the uh, the uh, folks who are here, um, we actually thought the first two bills were going to be less contentious and take less time, so we tried to put them real quickly. Apparently, we miscalculated, um, but we do appreciate everyone staying and thank you for working with us. And actually, it shows how important the bill actually is and the importance of the folks uh, who remain here. So uh, here's what we're going to do now. We have uh, the panel that was originally going to go, Ken Fisher, Justin Pascone, Stuart O'Brien, Ryan Baxter, Donald Renz, Ransomate uh, from BTEA, they're going to testify on 1307A. Then we're going to have IBO 
Sarah Stefanski, who's going to testify in 385B. Then we're going to go to the rest of the public. The first panel, if they're still here, will be Jeffrey Bone, Rajiv Jaswa, Jason Wu, Benjamin Kennett, and Ruth Berta Kennett, Daniel Carpenter Gold, and Matthew Shashir. So in this panel also, uh, in the interest of time, we're doing both pro and con. Uh, the last panel did it very well, so hopefully you will as well. We'll do the pro first and the con after. Uh, anybody who's going to testify, please raise your right hand. Do your friend tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions. Um, you have two minutes each to uh, give your testimony. Do you want to start with me? Yeah, okay. Pro first. Okay, and then I'll go. I'm Stuart O'Brien, Executive Director of the Plumbing Foundation. I'm here uh, not only in behalf of the Plumbing Foundation, but in, also uh, by the, uh, in, in testifying uh, for the Fire Sprinkler Council and, and the MCA. Um, uh, I have handed out the testimony, so I'm going to go off script and just uh, make a, a few comments. The first is I'm reading from DOB's testimony on 1307. Uh, of the 325,000 inspections, there were those that require significant technical knowledge of our codes and relate to high-risk work such as crane-supported excavation, demolition of gas piping. I would add electrical and sprinkler work as well. Alternatively, there are tens of thousands of inspections we perform, meaning DOB, each year that are simpler and more administrative in nature. This would include inspections of curb cuts, decks, and fencing and checking on the status of vacate and stop work orders. So um, the, the problem is the DOB lays out there are very technical safety ones and then there are administrative kind of inspections. Uh, the problem with this bill is it treats all inspections the same. It reduces the qualifications from five years to two years for all types of inspections. Uh, we think that's uh, a, a, an error. We're supportive of the DOB reducing the inspections uh, but not f across the board. For example, in plumbing, what a plumber needs to know. There are four areas of plumbing, service work, repair and maintenance, alteration, moving piping from here to there to reconstruct or uh, redo uh, a uh, building, and new construction. The types of work, gas piping, medical gas piping, welding, water distribution, sanita uh, sanitary, storm or water drainage, etc. The types of buildings you work in, one and two families, multiple dwellings, office buildings, high-rise residential, hospitals, institutional, and so on. You can't get exposure for the plumbing work and the safety work and the gas piping and the welding and the medical gassing in two years, right? So we think the solution is very simple. The bill is good, but just carve out on the safety inspections, the high-rise that DLB points out, yes, uh, these are the ones we do, carve them out. Uh, and, and so uh, to amend the bill, to, and that, I think that's a fairly easy thing to do. Lay out plumbing inspections, which cover plumbing, gas piping, and sprinkler work, electrical inspectors, and crane inspectors, and I think the bill would, would, would help the city a lot. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Williams. Um, Donald Ranchty, Senior Vice President, Building Trades Employees Association, and we are here also to support the bill. 1307, uh, which would uh, change the qualifications for buildings department inspectors. Uh, I, I'd like to reiterate some of the comments that were made, and I won't go into the testimony because it, it'll be very similar. Um, we also agree that um, as a longtime advocate for more resources for the Department of Buildings, that the ability for them to hire from a wider and deeper breadth uh, a pool of talent is, is a great idea. And also, the Buildings Department has, in recent years, created what they call Buildings University. It's the internal, in, internal training module for inspectors. So in addition to their outside experience, which may or may not be useful to them once they become an inspector, 
Buildings University cross trains them in, in the multi disciplines that the building the buildings department inspectors would go out and see in the field every day. Subsequent to that, there's also another split inside the department where there are called uh, the development, I think my colleague used the word administrative inspections, and then there's the enforcement inspections. So not only um, does the Department of Buildings within its mission to, um, to enforce the building code and, and partially the zoning resolution need to have a, uh, a more experienced um, person that they can recruit from in the workplace, adding on the new disciplines of sustainability is a factor um, which is not called for in the, in the charter. So we, we are very much in support of having the buildings department be able to um, pull from any of those groups that they feel necessary without being tied to the, um, all of the requirements that are currently in the charter. And to just uh, add in one thing further, with all of the legislation that the council has, is currently um, reviewing, it has put forth since January of this year, including the, the worker safety training bill, to have more buildings department inspectors on the ground as quickly as possible is really just a great idea, and I think that um, we should move forward with the bill. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Ryan Baxter, Vice President at the Real Estate Board of New York. I will be reading just a short selection of my colleague Carl Hum's testimony in support of 1307. I don't want to retread on things that were already said by my colleagues here, but to expound on some of the professionals DOB cannot con currently consider. That includes licensed site safety managers, masters, plumbers, and electricians, as well as crane operators. And as we've discussed, we believe that the charter's minimum qualifications hinder DOB's ability to evolve with the industry. As Donald mentioned, there's the training academy that provides 12 weeks of in the classroom, on, on the job and in the field, excuse me, in the classroom and on the job training over the 12 week period. And we believe to remedy this circumstance permanently, the inspector qualification should be left to the determination of the commissioner of the Department of Buildings as well as the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. We look forward to continuing our conversations and happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Council member. Mr. Chairman, uh, Ken Fisher on behalf of the American Council of Engineering Companies in opposition to 1307A in its present form. Uh, we've submitted our testimony for the record. I just want to make three points to you quickly. One is I think inadvertently DOB created a, uh, a misimpression. Um, they actually have no requirement for any experience whatsoever for most of the new um, qualifications that they've established. So a certification, by who, we don't know, how long, whatever, um, 60 college credits, you never have to be on a construction site, and under DOB's um, uh, pro uh, proposal, that would be acceptable. We don't think that's a good idea. And I think Mr. O'Brien, who testified in favor of the bill, agreed, agreed with me on, uh, on that. Um, secondly, uh, you know, for all practical purposes, this bill, because it's so ill-defined, would leave it to the discretion of, of DOB. And I have to say, on behalf of ACEC, we've worked very closely with Commissioner Chandler. We think he's doing a great job. 400 of our members donate thousands of hours a year working on technical committees to make sure that DOB gets it right. So what would be wrong with that? Well, I've been around long enough to remember when we didn't have money and we had political influence, we had corruption at the DOB. And as I said to my friends over there, I trust you and I trust your successor, but I don't trust your successor's successor. And construction safety is just too important to leave uh, uh, wide open like that over the long term. And then lastly, we have a solution for you, at least a starting place for a solution. I'm not sure why DOB never sat down with us to discuss it, but this council has required um, developers to hire special inspectors to do 17 different kinds of inspections. It's in the building code now. Um, and the qualifications for each of them are laid out. So I have a copy we can hand up to the, uh, to the chair. It sets up a matrix for the less serious uh, inspections, the administrative ones, less credentials. For the more serious ones, more credentials. And we don't see why any, any reason why they shouldn't be doing it yet. They can't take uh, shortcuts with safety. And I'm happy to hand this up. Uh, do we have that? Okay. 
uh, it's in the building code, but I'm, I, we haven't submitted this. I, I have a copy for okay, you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. My name is Justin Pascone. I'm here on behalf of the American Institute of Architects in the New York chapter. Um, as a professional trade organization for architects, we work side by side with the buildings department um, as an organization, and our members work with them on a daily basis, including their inspectors. Um, we want to express our concern with the bill. I think you've heard, uh, I'm going to echo some of those concerns. Uh, the department needs more inspectors. Um, we believe that. We think that's in the best interest of the department, of the public, of our profession. But quantity of per inspectors is not a replacement for quality. Um, we think the department needs more experienced, qualified inspectors. Um, we also acknowledge, and you heard the administration and, and some of my colleagues as well, um, you know, there are inspectors that we think lowering the qualifications makes sense. There's a certain types of positions. Um, but specifically for um, inspectors that um, curtail uh, construction work in, in performance quality and code compliance, uh, we think the current qualifications um, are sufficient and reasonable. Um, again, we applaud the work of Commissioner Chandler and his staff. Uh, we, we have a lot of faith that this bill would get carried out with the best of all intentions, um, but we just want to make sure that his successor and successor successors is able to do that as well. Uh, we're willing to work with uh, this committee and the Department of Buildings to, to sort of flesh out what the difference is here. Thank you very much, uh, each of you, for your testimony. I appreciate your patience in uh, staying to give it. Uh, next, we have uh, Sarah Stefanski from the IBL, who is uh, going to give a uh, what the impact would be for the asthma bill. <laughs> Ms. Stefanski, in the interest of time, I'm going to help put up a guide of five minutes to help uh, with the testimony. Do want to get to uh, the good people who waited so long to testify as well. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm and tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. You can begin. Good afternoon, Chair, Chairman Williams and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. My name is Sarah Stefanski, and I'm the housing analyst at the New York City Independent Budget Office. I'm here to talk about intro 385B that would set new rules for identifying and correcting instances of indoor allergen hazards, specifically mold and pests in residential housing. In 2016, IBO prepared a cost estimate on this intro at the request of Council Member Mendez. While our analysis for the Council Member and my comments today focus on the potential cost to the city of implementing the intro, rather than potential benefits of reduced exposure to mold, pests, and other allergens, it does not imply that the costs outweigh the benefits or that costs are the most important factor to consider. Intro 385B would increase HPD's costs in two ways. First, the legislation would increase the agency's inspection and administrative costs. This is because going forward, all new indoor allergen violations would have to be reinspected to verify that violations have been corrected. And because the legislation classifies more violations as Class C compared with current rules. Class C violations are the most serious and require more administrative oversight than Class A and B violations due to their emergency nature. Second, HPD is authorized to repair conditions causing Class C violations through its emergency repair program if they remain unresolved by the building owners, although intro 385B does not require the city to do so. The extent to which this intro increases HPD's budget largely depends on whether the agency chooses to make repairs for indoor allergen Class C violations that are not corrected by building owners. The cost to HPD also depends on how much, if at all, the, complaint, the number of complaints and therefore violations rise as the intro increases public awareness of indoor allergen hazards. Although it is likely that the number of complaints would increase, there is no relevant precedent on which to base an estimate of how much an increase would occur. Therefore, in addition to an estimate of cost at current violation levels, 
IBO conducted an incremental analysis that can be scaled up or down to model different scenarios of changes in the number of complaints. So looking at the, the fiscal impact of intro 385B at current violation levels. So first, IBO reviewed data for violations between 2011 through 2015 and then modeled how mold and pest related violations would be reclassified under this proposed law. While IBO does not expect the intro to result in a dramatic shift in the way mold violations are classified, there would be a significant change in how pest violations are classified. Most pest violations are currently considered class A or B, and the intro re would require all instances of pest infestations to be categorized as class C. Holding indoor allergen complaint and violations study, IBO estimates if HPD chooses not to make repairs for the newly classified Class C violations, the annual cost to HPD would be $1.6 million in additional inspection and administrative expenses. In contrast, if HPD makes emergency repairs at the rate it currently does for other Class C violations, IBO estimates that the additional cost of repairs would be $1.9 million which would bring the total expenditure to nearly 3.5 million a year. When the city corrects an emergency violation, however, the cost of the repair with interest is billed to the building owner, and if unpaid, may become a lien against the property. Through the lien process, part of the cost of repair is recouped by the city in subsequent years. So we're adding cost if the city addresses repairs, but then the city bills owners and recoups a portion of that cost. Assuming the city spends $1.9 million a year on repairs to remediate indoor allergens under 385B, IBO estimates that the city would recoup $910,000 within two years and just over $1.5 million within five years. So this would bring the net annual cost of 385B at current complaint levels and repair rates to a total of $1.9 million after five years of emergency repair collections. HPD would also experience a one-time upfront cost of $100,000 to update its violation tracking computer programs to reflect changes in classifications and timelines under this bill. Now I'm going to discuss how an increase in complaints would have a fiscal impact. In 2015, HPD received about 82,000 unique complaints about pests and mold. IBO estimates that 8,200 additional complaints, which would be a 10% increase from current levels, will lead to an additional annual cost to HPD of about $550,000 compared with the baseline complaint levels, assuming no additional repairs are made. If HPD makes additional emergency repairs, their annual cost would raise by nearly $900,000 compared with the baseline level. In the latter case, some of these costs, again, would be recouped from building owners. Within two years, IBO estimates that $170,000 would be collected by the city, and within five years, an estimated $280,000 would be collected back. Therefore, the net annual cost for each 8,200 complaints, assuming HPD makes it emergency repairs would be about $620,000 after five years of collections. There is also a fiscal impact for the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. DOHMH would incur expenses for preparing pamphlets and training materials, investigating the presence of indoor allergen hazards in cases where the housing maintenance code enforced through HPD would not apply, and for implementing a referral system for physicians to arrange for household inspections for patients with respiratory illness. IBO estimates a total of five, 520,000 in upfront costs and 430,000 annually thereafter for DOHMH, with an additional 14,000 a year for an increase if we had a 10% increase in complaints. Two cost-related considerations were outside the scope of the IBO analysis. We did not estimate costs associated with an increase in housing litigation. If this bill increases the number of violations, it may also increase the cost to HPD's housing litigation division. 
We also did not estimate how this bill may impact housing code violations in residential units within the New York City Housing Authority, which HPD does not inspect. Thank you for your time, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Councilman Mendes, do you have any questions? Thank you very much for your testimony. Jeffrey Bond, Rajiv Jaswa, Jason Wu, Benjamin Canet, Ruth Bird, Berda Canet, Daniel Carpenter Gold, and Matthew Shashir. And I'm going to call the uh, panel that's scheduled after them. Uh, everybody who signed up will have an opportunity to testify. Uh, Rolando Guzman, Margarita Long. Fabian Butavo from Sunset Park and Kelly Espinal will be uh, following this panel. Jeffrey Bond, is Jeffrey Bond here? Uh, Rajiv Jaswa, Jason Wu, Benjamin Canet, and Ruth Berda Canet, Daniel Carpenter Gold, and Matthew Shashir. Uh, can you please each raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. You have two minutes to give your testimony. You can begin in the order of your preference. Thank you uh, to the committee. Uh, my name is Matthew Shashir. I'm an attorney with Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation in Washington Heights and in the Bronx. I appreciate your invitation to testify today. According to the Health Department's data, Washington Heights has the second highest incidence of reported mold problems in homes, highest incidence of water leaks and cockroaches, one of the highest incidences of mice, of holes that permit vermin ingress, and not surprisingly, very high levels of asthma. Um, I've been a practicing attorney in, in housing uh, for over 30 years, and much of my work is focused on this intersection between housing and health. Um, and as a member of this coalition, I've worked very closely with Council Member Mendes' office and others to help develop this proposal. This bill is an effort to craft a meaningful response to the chronic asthma triggers in private rental housing and what has been up till now a less than effective code enforcement regime. For example, while the Health Department since 1993 has had recommendations and guidelines for the control and remediation of mold, and these guidelines are considered to be state-of-the-art by other jurisdictions, they've remained just guidelines. And I can tell you, as a tenant attorney, that if you take this to the court and try to get the landlords to follow the guidelines, the judges are going to say, counselor, they're just guidelines. Same thing in terms of, of pests. Uh, integrated pest management is well recognized as beneficial in, in having meaningful control of, of pests as an asthma trigger. And in fact, since 2005, it's been mandated under Local Law 37 for use in city-owned buildings but not in private dwellings. Unfortunately, the, the current housing code doesn't require that. As a result, we see the same pest conditions and mold conditions return again and again and again and again without effective correction. It is an exceedingly poor use of code enforcement resources, attorney resources, court resources, frustrating to tenants and health care providers alike, and in the long run makes our residents less healthy. Um, we know that poor housing conditions have a significant adverse impact on public health, and we know that effective code enforcement can have a tremendously positive impact, as our lead law has shown. The same progress could be achieved here, so I urge that this bill, after 10 years of kicking around in the Council, be finally moved into law. Uh, I understand there, that the uh, HPD yet again has concerns about some of the details and wants to make further amendments to this law. I just would urge that we keep our eye on the prize here and that if the bill gets watered down much more, we end up with something that really doesn't do anything meaningful. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. My name is Jeffrey Bowen. I'm a paralegal at MFY Legal Services. MFY Legal Services' mission is to achieve social justice by prioritizing the needs of people who are low income, disenfranchised, or have disabilities. And I work in MFY's housing project, um, which is, is at MFY to prevent homelessness and to help, uh, help preserve affordable housing in New York City. This afternoon, I'd like to tell you a story of a client of mine. Let's call her Mrs. E. Every day, Mrs. E takes the hand of her three small children, who are asthmatic, and dreads going back to her third-story apartment. A persistent mold infestation has taken over the walls of her bathroom and her kitchen. On countless occasions, Mrs. E has attempted to re uh, remediate this mold infestation by swabbing with a streak of bleach, but this quick fix only lasts a few weeks. As a recent immigrant with limited English proficiency and extremely limited resources, Missy fears the consequences of speaking up and exerting her rights for a safe and decent apartment for her and her family. Missy feels trapped within the confines of two undesirable choices, either continue living in a an hazardous and dangerous apartment with her and her family or, jo or risk joining the roughly 60,000 homeless individuals in New York City. Unfortunately, Missy's story is not uncommon. Hundreds of tenants are placed at a heightened risk of contracting or experiencing height, um, exacerbated symptoms of asthma simply based upon the zip code that they call home. Quite frankly, this is what's defined as environmental racism. Poor housing conditions disproportionately affect low-income communities and communities of color. The Bronx has six of the highest poverty-stricken neighborhoods in New York City and, in addition, sees the highest rates of both asthma hospitalizations and deaths. Three times more households in high-poverty areas report three more um, repair issues as compared to households that are classified as more affluent. Systematic building repairs and shoddy building conditions are an accomplice to the staggering asthma rates in low-income communities like the Bronx. Despite the fact that 6% of Americans suffer from asthma, nearly one in four children in some low-income communities in New York City suffer from asthma. That is why MFY Legal Services strongly pass, uh, supports the passage of Intro 385B and believes that it is crucial legislation which will support a decent quality of life for children at risk for and are already affected by asthma as a result of mold and pest infested environments. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you to the Chair and Council Member Mendez. <clears throat> My name is Rajiv Jaswa. I'm an attorney at the Urban Justice Center's Community Development Project. Each year, we represent hundreds of tenants who slip through the cracks of an aging code enforcement system and live with recurring leaks and mold despite the best efforts of their attorneys, advocates, and city enforcement officials. The city's housing maintenance code was enacted in 1967. And it established a basic requirement that landlords must maintain apartments in, quote, good repair. But it didn't say anything about mold. And today, 40 years later, when an HPD inspector responds to a mold complaint, the inspector still acts under the imprecise authority of the Housing Maintenance Code's general good repair language. Since 1967, we have come a long way in our understanding of the relationship between building dampness, indoor mold growth, and adverse health outcomes. We know that roughly 4.6 million reported asthma cases in the United States are attributable to dampness and mold exposure in the home. We know that dampness and indoor mold exposure is a particularly serious health issue in New York City and one that cuts right down lines of racial and economic inequality. These disparities appear most starkly when looking at adjacent neighborhoods. For example, children in East Harlem make nearly 13 times as many asthma-related emergency room visits as their neighbors in the Upper East Side. But today we also know how <clears throat> much more about how to solve the problem through code revisions that require proven mold remediation approaches, like addressing the underlying conditions so supporting mold growth and providing occupants and workers with uh, effective protection. The Community Development Project strongly supports Intro 385B because we believe it's time for our laws to catch up with what we know and that's exactly what this legislation does. Um, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair. Thank you, Chair Williams, Council Member Mendez, and the Committee on Housing and Buildings for the opportunity to provide testimony, testimony today on behalf of the Legal Aid Society. The Legal Aid Society is the oldest and largest uh, legal services provider um, serving the indigent. 
We have three major practices, civil, criminal, and juvenile rights. Within our civil practice, we handle more than 47,500 individual cases involving immigration, domestic violence, housing, among many other practice areas. I am a staff attorney in the Legal Aid Society's Housing Development Unit, located in the Harlem Community Law Office. I represent 10 associations, including affirmative litigation, to help tenants get repairs and essential services, um, among a range of other issues regarding landlord harassment. Our experience in representing housing clients confirmed that the existence of indoor allergens is a significant issue for many New York City tenants, an issue that HPD and the courts to date have not dealt with effectively. Due to factors including a lack of expertise and a dearth of clear standards for dealing with these issues. The proposed bill addresses these problems by providing clearer technical standards and guidelines for remediation with greater focus on underlying causes, requiring greater information sharing and clarifying HPD's obligation in this area. It is no secret there are landlords who neglect units occupied by long-term tenants as, a, as part of a broader strategy to increase turnover and displacement. Due to loopholes in the rent laws, landlords receive a windfall every time that an apartment becomes vacant. Therefore, the incentive to harass long-term tenants out of their homes by ignoring housing code violations has only increased over the last decade. Many tenants are forced to endure hazardous conditions in their apartments and buildings for years. However, some tenants do abandon their apartments and become homeless and struggle to find safe and stable housing. And while there are complaint options available for tenants through HPD or in housing court, there remain many challenges for tenants effectively enforcing those rights. First, most tenants do not know their rights or what options and resources are available to them. Second, many tenants find the prospect of legal action to be extremely difficult for a number of reasons. Language access, landlord intimidation, time and effort needed to participate in litigation and financial costs. Third, underlying conditions that create indoor allergens are especially difficult to address through HPD complaints or in housing court. Even with litigation, tenants may find the conditions such as mold and leaks recurring after the, only, after the owner made cosmetic repairs just sufficient to lift the most recent violation. Introduction 385B appropriately addresses these issues. And in my written testimony, I give two case studies. One is an example where if Ms. P was protected under Introduction 385B, she might still be in her, in her home. She may still have her section. Can I have to ask you to give a closing sentence? And the second example is a tenant that I represented for uh, the past two years, and prior to my representation, he had been struggling for decades to get the mold and uh, mice infestation um, remediated properly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time today. I'm Ruth Berda Kene. And I'm Benjamin Kene. Uh, we moved from France to New York in 2003 and have been permanent residents uh, here for five years. Ruth is a filmmaker, and I'm an investment professional at a hedge fund. Our son, Noah, has just turned two and has been poisoned with mold for a year because of our management company's negligence. We do not have a long time to speak today, so we'll get straight to the core of the issue. We're, fortunate, we're fortunate enough to earn fairly high incomes, which means we have the financial means to fight our management company, pay medical bills, find a new apartment, move out, and soon hire legal counsel. But most New Yorkers, especially New Yorkers who are confronted with mold issues, are usually not as financially comfortable as we are. This is, this is why we believe it is crucial for us to testify today. Our story started in March of 2016. We lived on the 27th floor uh, of a dorm in building at 345 East 80th Street, and a leak soaked the hallway carpet right outside our apartment. We told the super and the management company about this, but they claimed they couldn't find the source of the leak. After a few months, a nasty white stain started to appear on the carpet and spread out, producing a foul smell. We asked them if this could be mold, but they dismissed it without even investigating. They made fun of us and did nothing. Over the same period, our then one-year-old baby was suffering from severe and constant breathing issues 
that led to very serious asthma flares and even a, a hospitalization. We were constantly running from doctors to doctors. Even the slightest cold would morph into terrible asthma flares. His treatment was very heavy with both albuterols and steroids around the clock, but to our dismay, we never saw much improvement. Despite reporting our son's issue to the super and management company for a month, they just did not want to take that problem seriously. So three months ago, we decided to hire one of the best inspection company in the city, and the results were terrifying. We had spore, mold spore level more than 100 times normal levels, and one of two worst kinds of mold causing asthma and skin lesion, and the recommendation to leave the premises immediately. Despite this evidence and detailed remediation um, recommendation, the management company refused to do appropriate remediation, leaving us no other choice but to move out permanently. Within days after we moved, NOAA's condition improved drastically, but the doctors are not sure about long-term consequences of such a high and prolonged mold exposure. Needless to say that Ruth and I still live in fear every time NOAA catches a cold, and as you can imagine, it happens a lot with a two-year-old. Management companies and supers do not take more mold seriously, partially because it's silent and often invisible. Imagine if we had the same amount of cockroaches per cubic square as we did with those mold spores. For sure, they would have dedicated their whole day to find the source of the nest. But the super and the management company did nothing. And if knowing that a baby was critically sick for a year did not coerce the management company to act quickly and efficiently, we hope that the power of the law will. We place our trust in our policymakers today to avoid other families and often less fortunate to have to go through the same hell we just escaped from. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much to the chair, Councilwoman Mendez, and the committee. Um, my name is Daniel Carpenter Gold. I am a Healthy Housing Legal Fellow with New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, or NILPI. Uh, NILPI is uh, very pl pleased to be here today in support of 385B because this uh, bill addresses issues at the nexus of our three programmatic areas disability justice, health justice, and environmental justice. And I might add that we run an environmental and health literacy campaign uh, encouraging people to report issues like this to 311 and through that to HPD uh, and therefore to uh, make sure that these issues get remediated. So intro 385B directly addresses the needs that our clients and communities have seen uh, by implementing reforms in three key areas. First, the bill creates an affirmative duty and effective process for landlords to inspect and abate mold uh, and, and other uh, vermin problems and remediate it once they find it. Uh, under the current process, tenants must wait until they can basically prove either to the landlord or the court uh, that they have a mold or vermin infestation. 385B would effectively put the onus on the landlord to seek out and correct these problems. This solves the problem more rapidly and cheaply. It prevents unnecessary litigation and it helps to preserve New York City's precious affordable housing stock. Second, the bill strengthens HPD's role in the process. The agency has immense expertise and practical experience in correcting poor housing conditions, and this bill would empower them to do even more, to inspect uh, more thoroughly, and to issue stiffer penalties. Third, 385B creates a pathway for tenants' doctors who have both the training to know when asthma uh, may be exacerbated by indoor air quality and, cl and the close connection with their patients to know when they need help. Uh, to, it empowers them to initiate this process of inspection and remediation. This radically expands the opportunities for effective intervention in the process so that even tenants who do not themselves realize they might be at risk can be helped. Uh, so thank you very much for your time and we urge you to um, support this bill. Thank you all, all for your testimony and the work that you're doing. Uh, Ms. Brother Kone and Mr. Kone, thank you uh, for your, your personal testimony. Obviously for your own description, you didn't necessarily have to, but I appreciate you taking up the fight, and I'm sorry for butchering your name. Um, Councilman Griffin. Um, I want to thank this panel for their testimony. For the attorneys on this panel, I'd like to know um, of the cases that you've um, 
have represented tenants that have had mold. In how many percentage of the cases do the landlord uh, actually do the repair? If they do the repair and abate it, um, in what percentage of the cases does the mold come back? And in the cases where they've abated the mold and it did not come back, how long did it take the landlord to do the repair? We can start from this side and go back. Coun Council member, I, I don't have with me empirical data. However, I can tell you that it, and if you'll see in my written testimony, I have a photograph there of one of my client's apartments, and that picture shows that's the intersection of the ceiling and wall. So you can see there's about 20, 30 square feet. That was a couple of months after the landlord had abated, quote unquote, the mold. Um, and those are precisely the kinds of recurrent chronic conditions that we're trying to get at with, with this legislation. Uh, precisely because there is no required methodology in treating the underlying condition. So often what happens is the landlord throws bleach on the surface, which as um, uh, professionals in the environmental toxicology field have explained to me, is sort of like giving crack to the mold because it's full of water. And that's what the mold feeds on. So, you know, bleach has water in it, you're just exacerbating the problem. So as I said, I don't have empirical numbers, but I can tell you from practical experience that the problems are often not remedied and they just keep coming back and back and back and back. And eventually the tenants get just disgusted with the whole process of taking time off from work and going to housing court where a judge just says, well, okay, get rid of it. And as long as the problem isn't visible anymore, HPD's fine and crosses the violation off the list, but the underlying condition hasn't been corrected. And that's what we're trying to get at. Um, I wish I could say I have worked on cases where I knew for sure that my work had effectively addressed the issue, but I, I don't know of any cases I've worked on like that. Like I, I consider it a victory if I know that some structural change took place um, if I can get the landlord to, to fix the ventilation system or fix the roof, that's a huge victory um, because that's not usually what we're able to achieve. And, and the biggest difficulty we have is that, um, you know, when a tenant calls 311, the landlord gets a notification before the inspector shows up. And it's really difficult to get HPD to come back and reinspect and issue like an aggravated violation. Um, because it's usually patched up before they come back, which deprives us of most of the enforcement tools or legal mechanisms we have to really um, bring about structural change. And, and that's the number one thing I think that's there in this bill, is that it focuses on the process as opposed to, to a visual inspection outcome. Um, so the cases where I feel like I've achieved something is when there's documentation of what the landlord actually did an intro 385 would make sure that that happens every single time there's a mold violation, and that's a huge deal. So, I, I don't think every, every case is different, and so sometimes you have landlords who will cooperate, especially if there's a legal service uh, provider uh, on the case, and they'll do the work, and the clients don't come back. But that, that doesn't always happen, and that usually doesn't happen. So when, when I have a, a case where there is recurring mold or um, recurring pest infestation, it may take a year, two years of litigation, contempt motions, trial, um, repeated requests from the court to reinspect the conditions. And this can be very, very taxing on the families that we represent. This, our clients are mothers with children. Do they, do, they have to, do they have child care to come to court? Do they bring their child to court? Our clients are disabled, they're seniors. Are they gonna come, commute from Washington Heights to uh, Center Street 
every time there's a court appearance. And so while there are complaint processes in place through HPD and through the housing court system, they're insufficient. And with introduction 385B, it would provide additional protections and enforcement mechanisms from the very beginning when HPD goes out to inspect. And so for me, I'm, I, while it would definitely benefit legal service providers like the Legal Aid Society to have intro 385B, it would, it would help alleviate some of the, the resource strain that goes into fighting enforcement cases like this. I think for pro se unrepresented tenants, they're the ones who are really, really struggling and most of them will never access uh, an attorney to represent them. Uh, I'll just add that uh, among the clients and callers that we've had, I've never seen one who hasn't first asked for some sort of repair from their landlord or their uh, management company. And in general, they don't always know what to ask for. They might you know, realize that there's a problem but not actually know what specific repair to ask for. But they definitely have tried that route and it has not been successful because of resistance by either the management company or the landlord or potentially some part of that staff. For um, Ruth and Benjamin, um, are you still living in another apartment or have you returned to your home? No, we found another apartment and we moved out. Basically, when we got the report from the mold company um, advising us to leave the premises immediately, we packed a bag and we did two hours we were gone. Um, I had a phone call within minutes of receiving the, um, uh, the email with the mold report with one of their uh, lab experts, and he told me that every hour I was spending in, in this uh, apartment would continue to weaken uh, our baby's immune system to the point where skin lesions started to appear. And this had just happened a couple of weeks ago, and he said that it was the last phase when the body just cannot handle things anymore, just, you know, some cracking of the skin. S go ahead. No, b basically, we moved out immediately, but we left them the chance to remediate, right? Because we were in a temporary apartment. The report um, it was very detailed in giving the steps that needed to be taken, not only to find and fix the source of the leak, but then all the steps to you know, repair the walls and the surfaces, right? So honestly, we thought that with a report like that, the management company would do the work. But after more than a month of basically doing nothing and back and forth and yelling on the phone, and I don't know if you can tell, we can fight. We decided that we had to find a, uh, a permanent apartment. And so again, we had the means to find an apartment quickly and move just a block away from our previous apartment. But again, most people don't have that luck. It's quite amazing to see that despite a report like that, and we attached some you know, pictures of the condition of our child, you could definitely tell that the management company did not feel the urge to do anything and we hope that this law is going to solve that issue. Thank you very much. Um, so can anyone on the panel of the attorneys tell me if you've had cases where, as in this case, they have moved out and a new tenant has come into the same apartment and it's the same condition? What I can say is for our case is that they haven't fixed the issue yet. Mm -hmm. They did very cosmetic repairs and now I think they are looking for new tenants. Okay. Yeah, I can, the, the, the closest example I have is um, one of my clients, uh, in addition to doing an HP action, we also did a reasonable accommodation request and due to his advocacy, like he's very involved in the, in the organizing group we work with, we got the owner to agree to pay for an industrial hygienist to, to do a full assessment of his apartment and 
the owner agreed to transfer him to another apartment, and the owner had basically offered a one-month abatement to anyone else in the building who would agree to switch apartments with him. So the owner wasn't going to actually fix up the other apartment. They were just going to shuffle people around. The problem is the entire building has these structural problems, and all of the apartments I went to with my client as, as potential transfer options also had leaks. So no transfer ended up happening, but it sort of speaks to the problem I think you were getting at. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for all the testimony. Uh, Rolando Guzman, Senior Alliance. Rolando Guzman here. Oh. Margarita, I think it's Long, Luna. Margarita Luna. Fabian Bravo. Is Fabian Bravo here? Kelly Espinal. Is that, she's outside. <clears throat> Genesis Miranda. Make the road. Genesis Miranda. Um, Rolanda Guzman is here, right? Rolanda Guzman. Fabian Bravo. Uh, Kelly Espinal. That's Kelly Espinal. Margarita Luna. Um, Genesis Miranda. Is Genesis here? We have Rolanda Guzman, Fabian Bravo, Kelly Espinal, Margarita Luna. Yeah, but they have translated. Is everybody everybody testify, testifying has a translator? Just a few. Just a few. Yeah. Oh, let me go through this again. Rolanda Guzman, Fabian Bravo, Kelly Espinal. That's you. And you have a translator? Okay. And Margarita Luna. Yeah, okay. I'm not, I'm not understanding what you That's Margarita Luna, correct? That's Margarita Luna? There's no Margarita Luna. There's no Margarita Luna? Yes. And, and you're translating for her? And who are you translating for? This gentleman here. And so this gentleman with her? I see. Okay. So there are four people testifying right now? Yes, yeah, correct. Okay. Genesis. <laughs> Who's Genesis? Genesis. Genesis Miranda, okay. So there are five people testifying and two translators. Okay. Uh, can everybody please raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? You'll each have uh, two minutes to testify. If you have a translator, you have two minutes plus two minutes for the translator. You can begin in order of your preference. Um, good afternoon, um, Chair Williams and uh, Council Member Mendez. Uh, my name is Rolando Guzman. I'm the uh, Deputy Director for Community Preservation at St. Nick's Alliance. Uh, we are here also as a members of the um, Coalition Against Illegal Hotels, and um, we are here just to testify uh, touching two bills, but uh, we're going to start with the intro 1589 first. 
Um, we have some concerns about this bill. Uh, North Brooklyn is a mix of housing. We have multifamily buildings from six all the way to 100 plus units, mostly rent stabilized. And also we have a large number of two family homes in our community. At the same time, North Brooklyn is one of the epicenters of displacement in the city of New York. Uh, tenants are being pushed out, not only from the rent stabilized units, but also from the two family homes in our community. And uh, we have a big push uh, for high paying the tenants uh, moving in and the uh, very much the greed of landlords and homeowners trying to multiply their um, building income. Uh, we see um, that this uh, legislation as it is right now uh, kind of opens a door for more displacement in our two family homes in the uh, community. I want to say though that we as an organization, we support the small business, we support uh, legal BNBs, and, uh, but we have a, a cer certain concern with this, uh, the nature of this legislation. Uh, we look forward working with you on that, and, uh, uh, and again, um, we're looking forward that a, 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 a legislation that can protect the small businesses, but at the same time can keep available the housing in our community. Second, real quick, we are also supporting uh, intro uh, 385B. The uh, mode is an uh, issue that we have in our community that is affecting the uh, housing conditions of our tenants, and it needs to be regulated. A lot of our clients come to our, our office um, complaining about mold, and like many people say before, landlords sometimes they just put bleach and or paint it over, and days or weeks later the problem is again. So I think regulation on those two items is uh, timely. Thank you so much. Muy buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Fabián. Vivo en el 430 de la calle 61 en Brooklyn, Nueva York, en Sunset Park. Y estoy con el grupo de vecinos ayudando a vecinos. El mo, las cucarachas y ratones son causa que desencadenan el asma y que afecta a muchos niños. Mi hija Samantha padece de asma. Desde entonces acude a más citas médicas y usa medicamentos como el que tengo en la mano. El asma impide a mi hija hacer muchas actividades físicas. Una noche mi hija tuvo un ataque de asma. Las imágenes, el pánico y angustia que sentí en esa noche aún las tengo en mi mente. Y desde esa noche tomamos una decisión. Luchar en contra de la dueña quien se niega a hacer reparaciones de limpieza, de mo, cucarachas, condiciones que hasta el día de hoy tenemos en el departamento donde vivimos desde hace más de 15 años. Y aunque desde 2015 un juez y la agencia de la ciudad habían determinado que la dueña es responsable de las reparaciones del departamento, ella ha hecho muy poco. No han sido suficientes, sencillamente la dueña no obedece el dictamen del juez. Y, y en el departamento aún tenemos estas mismas condiciones. Y así como esta dueña del edificio, existen, muy, existen muchos más dueños que evaden y que no obedecen el dictamen de un juez. Ya que los dueños de edificios saben que no existe ninguna ley que los presione al mantenimiento adecuado de los apartamentos y de los edificios. No es justo que sigan aumento los niños que padecen de asma en la ciudad por causas de estas condiciones. Hoy pedimos a los concejales aquí presentes su apoyo en esta nueva ley llamada la 385. Necesitamos esta nueva ley que obligue a los dueños de edificios a que tomen medidas adecuadas y que mantengan más limpios los edificios. Necesitamos que los dueños de edificios no sigan evadiendo sus responsabilidades. Necesitamos un cambio. La decisión de hoy depende de la vida de, de muchos niños. Good afternoon, my name is Fabian Bravo, and I live on 61st Brooklyn in Sunset Park. I'm in, I'm in a neighborhood group that helps assist other neighbors. My daughter, Samantha, suffers from asthma. I'm always taking her to the doctor's appointments, getting her medications, and in addition, asthma prevents her from doing many physical activities. One night, my daughter had a very severe asthma attack. The images of the attack, the panic, and anxiety still haunt me until this day. 
That night I made a decision to fight against the owner of the building who neglected to make the proper repairs, who neglected to remove the mold, the roaches, and the current conditions which, have been living, which we have been living with for the last 15 years. Since 2015, the judge and the city agencies have ordered the building owner to make the necessary repairs. This has not been enough. Simply put, these repairs have simply been ignored. She ignores the order of the court and the city agencies, given we still have the same issues and conditions. And just like the owner of my building, there exist many owners who simply ignore and disregard the order of the courts. The owners of these buildings know the laws that, that exist do not put enough pressure on them to maintain these apartments. It is not fair that, the, that there still exists an increase in asthma-related cases in children and within the city of New York. Today, we ask the council members present for their support in the new law called 385. We need this new law to obligate the owners of buildings and to take adequate measures to maintain the cleanliness of these buildings. We need to make sure that building owners stop evading the law. My hope is that we have changed from today's decision. The lives of many children depend on this. Thank you, and I trust in your support. Mi nombre es Margarita Luna y soy parte del grupo Vecinos Ayudando de Vecinos. Vivo en el área de Sunset Park. Tengo, tengo vivienda en el siguiente edificio, en el 275 de la 46 y calle. Estoy viviendo por 14 años en el apartamento en el cual he tenido que estar pidiéndole al casero que las reparaciones del MO por áreas del baño en las ventanas y alrededor de las ventanas, paredes húmedas, goteras cuando llueve, ratones, cucarachas, áreas, en las, áreas de la cocina, el piso, paredes con hoyos y también chinches. Le he pedido varias veces verbalmente al dueño que hiciera las reparaciones, pero no me hizo caso. Y varias veces le mandé cartas hasta que fui a la corte, pero siempre posponía el caso o aplazaba el caso y duró el caso dos años porque a medio de juicio vendió el edificio y se comenzó una nueva, un nuevo caso. Varias veces me comuniqué con el 311 a la comunidad del edificio, a, a la ciudad. El edificio acumuló muchas violaciones durante estos durante estos años, mi familia, especialmente mis hijos, fueron afectados en su salud constantemente. Tenía que visitar la sala de emergencia por alergias del asma, bronquitis, noches constantes sin dormir, porque tenía que estar poniendo en med medicamentos con la máquina del asma. Por este problema y más, les pedimos a los concejales que por favor pasen la ley del 385 y protejan a nuestros hijos y a la comunidad. La ley 385 va a mejorar la salud de nuestros hijos y ordenar a los caseros que hagan las reparaciones apropiada, apropiadas en nuestro tiempo y en, en tiempo corto. Porque aunque mi casero limpió el mouse, cada tres meses vuelve a salir en las paredes del baño y ventanas. La, la ley solo ordena que los caseros limpien el mou con, con cloro y pintura, pero no cura el problema de sus, desde su origen. Si es una tubería rota o el techo y paredes, nada más. Gracias por su atención y por proteger a los inquilinos. My name is Margarita Luna, and I am part of the group of Neighbors Helping Neighbors. I live at 275 46th Street, Sunset Park, Brooklyn. I've been living in that apartment for 14 years, and I've been asking the landlord to take care of the mold in the window areas and in the bathroom. I also, and also, the damp walls and the leaks whenever it rains, mice and roaches in the kitchen area, in holes and bedbugs in the floors and walls. 
I verbally requested the landlord to do the repairs several times, but he didn't do anything. I also sent letters many times. Then I went to court, but he would always postpone the case, which lasted two years since he sold the building in the middle of the trial. So a new case had to be started. I also contacted 311 several times. The building accumulated many violations. During these years, my whole family's health, especially my children's, was affected. I constantly had to go to the ER for allergies, asthma, and bronchitis. There were many nights without sleep because I had to be given asthma medication with a nebulizer machine. Because of these issues and others, we ask the council that please pass Law 385 to protect our children and the community. Law 385 will improve our children's health and will order landlords to take care of repairs appropriately in, time, in a timely ma manner. Even though my landlord removed the mold, it comes back every three months around walls and windows in the bathroom. The current law only requires the landlords to remove molds using bleach and paint, but not to remove the problem from the source, whether it might be a broken pipe or broken ceilings or walls. Thank you for your attention and for protecting the tenants. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Kelly Espinal. Estoy aquí hoy para apoyar el proyecto de la ley intro 385B. Soy miembro de SEACE Camino a la Nueva York. Mis mi dos hijos tienen asma. He vivido en Bushy, Brooklyn por más de 12 años. Cuando recién me pasé a vivir a Bushy, viví en una casa privada con mis dos hijos, Wellington y Yadier. Hoy Wellington tiene 14 años y Wellington Manuel 9. Nueve años de edad. Repetitivamente, en este primer hogar había presencia de gotera, de mojo. Debido a estas condiciones, Yadiel comenzó a sufrir de asma a muy temprana edad, con apenas ocho meses. Los doctores lo diagnosticaron con asma y desde entonces esto ha sido una pesadilla en nuestra familia. Actualmente vivo en un edificio de renta estabilizada en la calle Horsey, en Brooklyn. Las condiciones de nuestro apartamento no, no hacen bien para mis, para mis hijos. El dueño no repara. Las principales causas de la, de la persistencia del asma, mientras que me encuentro sentada aquí, hoy veo cómo bajan las gotas por las paredes de la cocina. El mojo sigue creciendo en nuestro, en nuestro baño y el apartamento es muy húmedo. Cada vez que mi hijo Yadiel cruza por, por la cocina, siente como le falta el oxígeno y como madre me preocupa. Los doctores han recetado muchos tipos de medicamentos, incluso han considerado medicamentos que son peligrosos para mi pequeño. Muchas veces he ido al hospital desde las 7 de la mañana y he pedido días de trabajo solo para que mi hijo pueda estar bien. Al borde de perder mi trabajo por la cantidad de ausencia, ya que he tenido que cuidar a mis hijos, hemos ido al hospital alrededor de 150 veces al año. Mi otro hijo, Wellington, tuvo un ataque de asma a sus 14 años. La seguridad, de nuestro, la seguridad de nuestro propio hogar, todo esto porque el dueño de casa nos repara la gotera en nuestro apartamento. Todo porque las casas buscan desalojarnos e incrementar la renta. Los dueños de la casa no le importa más que su edificio. Hemos, de, hemos demandado reparaciones en varias ocasiones, incluso en compañía de mis otros vecinos y vecinas. Hemos lanzado un caso legal en contra del dueño por reparaciones, pero aún así las goteras y el mojo perciben. Necesitamos leyes más fuertes para proteger a los inquilinos y nuestros hijos. Los doctores me han dicho que ellos esperan seguir controlando el asma de mis hijos, pero que esta enfermedad nunca podrá ser curada. Mientras nuestro hogar continúa inseguro, yo seguiré viviendo diariamente con el miedo de que, en cualquier, que cualquiera de mis hijos tomen, tomen su, su último ultimato. Gracias nuevamente a la vocera Melissa Mar, 
Viverito, a la consejera Méndez, al presidente del Comité William y a todos los miembros del Consejo de la Ciudad de Nueva York que defienden los derechos de los inquilinos. Gracias. I'll read it in English now. Good afternoon. Thank you to Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito, Committee Chair Jumani Williams, Council Member Rosie Mendez, and all of the Council Members here today for your leadership on this critical issue. I'm here today to support Intro 385B. My name is Kelly Espinal, and I'm a member of Make the Road New York. Both my sons have asthma. I've lived in Bushwick, Brooklyn for more than 12 years. When I first moved to Bushwick, I lived in a private house with my two sons, Willington, who is 14 years old, and Jadil, who is nine years old. In our first home, leaks and mold were present on walls of bathroom and bedrooms. Jadil began to suffer from asthma at a very early age. At just eight months old, doctors diagnosed him with asthma, and ever since, it has been our family's nightmare. Today, I live in a rent-stabilized building on Halsey Street in Bushwick, Brooklyn. The conditions in our apartment are that our landlord won't fix are the main issue, are the main cause of my son's persistent asthma. As I sit here today, leaks are streaming water down the walls of our kitchen. Mold is growing in our bathroom. Our whole apartment is humid and damp. These conditions continue to exacerbate Jadil's asthma. Every time Jadil passes by my kitchen, he becomes short of breath. It is, it is a daunting feeling as a parent. As I stay to fight for my rent-stabilized apartment, one of the last frontiers of affordable housing, I do so at the risk of my son getting sicker because my landlord refuses to fix. My son's doctors has tried many types of medicines, even considering stronger medicines that may not be suitable for a child my son's age. I've spent many days and nights in the hospital, sometimes rushing out of my apartment at odd hours of the night to seek care for my boy. The constant medical attention has put me in a difficult place at work. I've had many absences due to doctor's visits or my son's school calling me in, be calling me in because he is having trouble breathing. In one year, I can say that I have visited a hospital around 150 times in a single year. As you can see, my son's asthma affects every aspect of our lives, school, work, health, and safety. I'm here because my story is not an isolated one. Doctors and health experts, many of whom are here today, point to poor housing conditions like pests and mold being triggers of asthma. If we had additional protections for tenants that moved bad actor landlords to remediate these health and safety concerns, my son would be able to spend more time in his classroom rather than the emergency room. I have demanded repairs countless times, but my landlord seems more interested in getting us out so that he can see a rent increase. His profits are more important than the health and well-being of a nine-year-old child. With no other choice, we've worked with Make the Road New York to facilitate joint legal action against our landlord. As we await the outcome, leaks and mold persist. I'm here to urge you, the New York City Council, to pass this asthma-free housing act. With almost every council member already on board, we need to call a vote and start implementation immediately. Too many landlords, like my own, are using the lack of repair as a tool to get tenants to self-evict. Any tool that the city council can push for to prevent this kind of abuse is needed in this growing city where rents continue to rise, leaving families like me nowhere else to go. Thank you again to Speaker Mark, Melissa Mark Viverito, Council Member Mendez, Committee Chair Williams, and all of the New York City Council members for standing up for the tenants' rights. We need you. Good afternoon. My name is Genesis Miranda, and I am a staff attorney at Make the Road New York, a not-for-profit organization based in the communities of Bushwick, Brooklyn, Jackson Heights, Queens, Port Richmond, Staten Island, and Brentwood, Long Island. Make the Road builds the power of immigrant and working-class communities to achieve dignity and justice through organizing, policy initiative, innovation, transformative education, and survival services, which includes legal services. Our organization consists of more than 19,000 members, most of whom are immigrants and many of whom are living in substandard living. Make the Road New York supports Intro 385B, which provides a critical update to strengthen enforcement of housing standards relating to asthma, a condition that disproportionately affects low-income families and communities of color. Nationally, one in 11 children have asthma, though in low-income New York City areas, the rate is only is one in four. Mold growth is cited as being signific a significant environmental exposure factor associated to provoking asthma attacks. Importantly, the economic impact on low-income families with asthmatic children is great. Medical expenses average $618 a year for a child without asthma versus $1,042 for a child with asthma. 
This legislation recognizes that asthma triggering conditions will reoccur again and again unless they are repaired in an effective way and puts landlords on notice that a bare minimum patch job is not enough. By implementing work practices for pest and mold remediation, landlords can no longer default to doing shoddy work for the sake of avoiding HPD violations. Landlords must now follow proper work practices to eradicate pest infestation and mold. Furthermore, landlords are required to eliminate the underlying source of the condition, such as a water leak that consistently causes mold. By requiring landlords to adhere to specific work practices under intro 385B, tenants will no longer have to deal with reoccurring conditions. For instance, Myra Freire, one of my clients and a long-term tenant of Bushwick, has a 10-year-old son who suffers from severe asthma. Over the years, my client has made several 311 complaints regarding holes throughout her apartment and rodent infestation. Currently, there are op several open violations for the severe vermin infestation in my client's apartment. One violation is as old as 2013. Despite the multiple complaints and ensuing violations, her landlord has failed to permanently eradicate the vermin infestation that exists in her apartment. Even when the landlord attempts to repair the condition, her landlord sends unlicensed persons to spread highly toxic pesticide that in effect only serves to exasperate her son's asthma. Intro 385B would help my client and other families like hers to finally get to what often is underlying cause of persistent asthma. By enforcing effective and safe work to, uh, by enforcing effective and safe work practices for removing pest and mold conditions, families like Ms. Freire's will not have to continue to put up with ineffective repairs that exasperate asthma attacks. In addition to outlining specific you can give a closing sentence. Can I give two? <laughs> sure. However, we urge the council to strengthen this bill by making it clear that tenants can seek the same relief in housing court by obtaining a court order that directs their landlord to address underlying defects and follow proper work practices to eradicate pest infestation and mold. In conclusion, New York City residents deserve to live in homes with indoor, without indoor allergens that trigger asthma attacks. The city's passage of this bill continues to recognize the health hazard that is caused by pest infestation and mold growth and further strengthens the housing maintenance code. We thank the council for giving attention to the health of New York City tenants. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, para todo el mundo, gracias para su testimonio. Este, su testimonio era muy claro, no tengo preguntas, pero para señorita licenciada, um, Genesis Miranda. Yes. In your testimony, as you were reading, you said that your client has had violations since 2013, but in your written testimony it says 2009, so I just want a clarification. That was an error on my part, it's 2013. 2013, yes. okay, thank you very much. I, I want to thank this panel for their testimony. Thank you all very much. The next panel, Nadia Marin Molina, Naikash. Is she here, Nadia? Nadia here? Lily Corina Higgins? Lily Corina Higgins, is she here? Yes, did somebody say yes? Lily Corina Higgins? David Evans? Where we at? Is David Evans here? Jewel Jones? From We Act? I apologize in advance. <laughs> Jessica Quiminabe. Oh. Is Jessica here? I think it's pronounced Quiminabe. It just says tenant, Upper Manhattan. Lily Karina Higgins and Jessica Quimina Bay are not here, correct? Dr. Frank Poshia, Doctor's Council. Oh, they submitted testimony for the record. Dr. Frank Poshia submitted testimony for the record. 
Dr. Aklima Mohammed, Urban Health Plan. Dr. Aklima Mohammed. Is, is this Dr. Aklima? Yes. Shoshana Brown. So we have uh, Nadia Maureen Molina, David Evans, Jewel Jones, Dr. Aklima Mohammed, and Shoshana Brown. We got one more chair. Let's try to get one more person out. Is Dr. Lauren Zojak here? Children's Environmental Health. There's another chair over here. Doctor, there's one chair over here. Thank you. Can you each raise your right hand, please? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. And you should have two minutes. You can begin in order of your preference. Hello. Um, thank you to all the council members for your initiative in protecting community members, workers, and families, and thank you for having me at this hearing. Um, I'm here today to speak in support of the Asthma-Free Homes Bill on behalf of NICOSH, the New York Committee for Occupational Safety and Health. NICOSH is an independent nonprofit coalition of labor unions, workers, and health and safety professionals. We provide workers, unions, employers, and community-based organizations with technical assistance and safety and health training. Our mission is to secure every person's human right to a safe and healthy workplace. We have a long history of providing post-disaster mold awareness training and technical assistance to workers, volunteers, uh, property owners, and residents. Concern about indoor exposure to mold for workers has increased along with public awareness that exposure causes a variety of health effects and symptoms, including allergic reactions, which previous speakers have spoken about, so I won't get into detail on it. Um, in particular, the symptoms that are caused by workplace exposure to mold usually occur or get, get worse at work and then get better when uh, the workers are away from work workplace exposure. The legislation is going to have a positive impact on both residents and workers alike. It requires the New York City Department of Health inspections prompted by complaints, and then will determine uh, how the mold is restricted, whether it's restricted to the surface to ascertain what the extent of the damage is. By requiring the department to respond to concerns, the legislation is empowering community members who need the city's support. The legislation also ensures that supervising personnel are trained for indoor allergen in inspection, which uh, is important in ensuring that workers understand the risks associated with exposure. It also um, ensures the Department of Health promulgates rules and uh, create a report uh, outlining the implementation of the law, which we see as a critical component of measuring the legislation's effectiveness, as well as the fine structure. Uh, we support intro 385 and urge the council to act swiftly to uh, pass the legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my name's David Evans. I'm a professor of public health at Columbia. And I'm going to summarize the results of four studies that show that allergic reactions to cockroaches, mice, and rats, and mold increase asthma symptoms and the use of healthcare services and that also that integrated pest management is effective in controlling this problem. In the first, David Rosenstrike at Albert Einstein College of Medicine studied 476 low-income children with asthma and found that children who were both allergic to cockroaches and highly exposed to cockroach allergen in their homes were hospitalized three times more often than children who did not have both of these conditions. It's a huge difference. There are similar findings for mold. I worked with the New York Academy of Medicine to study 149 kids with asthma who were enrolled in Head Start. Families who said they saw mold or moisture uh, mildew on their uh, ceilings, walls, or windows reported three times more wheezing episodes and three times more respiratory hospitalizations in the last year, as well as twice as many nights wakened with respiratory symptoms in the last two weeks. Um, for IPM, 
um, Morgan studied uh, over 900 children who were randomly assigned to get an IPM intervention or a no intervention control. And he found that IPM group had 20% fewer days with symptoms than controls over the two year follow up period, um, as well as fewer days with limited play, fewer nights wakened for both children and parents, and fewer missed school days. Cockroach allergen was lowered in the IPM group, and the decrease in allergen was associated with fewer symptoms of asthma. And finally, unscheduled uh, visits for asthma to the ER clinic declined significantly. Our research group also studied the effectiveness of IPM in a study we did with um, the Department of Health and NYCHA uh, that compared IPM with traditional pest control, which is bait pucks with pesticide, to control cockroaches in uh, 280 NYCHA apartments. This was not a study of asthma patients. NYCHA pest control staff did the IPM, which took three hours for two workers. We found that IPM apartments had 43% fewer cockroaches trapped by our staff and 60% less cockroach allergen in the bedroom and kitchen. And then finally, poor housing conditions that allow pests to flourish occur most often in buildings and communities that are occupied by low-income minority groups. We believe this is one of the major reasons why Department of Health statistics show that children aged 5 to 14 in New York City from low-income neighborhoods have 1.6 times the rate of asthma and 3.6 times the rate of asthma hospitalizations as children from high-income neighborhoods. Thank you very much, and I urge you to support the bill. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, in strong support of Bill 385B. My name is Dr. Lauren Zajak, and I'm a pediatrician with special training in environmental health, and I work at the Children's Environmental Health Center at Mount Sinai, where we help families and communities are, who are concerned about how environmental exposures impact their children's health. And some of the most common things I hear about from families are indoor hazards like mold and pests. And uh, families really worry about how these are hurting their kids' health. And as a pediatrician, this worries me a lot, too. And a key management strategy, taking care of kids with asthma, aside from the medication, kind of the cornerstone is identifying and reducing the triggers that are making the asthma worse. And a lot of times, these triggers are found in the home. Um, and families are often frustrated by the lack of timely, safe, and permanent measures that eradicate these triggers, especially in old buildings. Um, and this bill is really, really needed to help kids. Um, kids are vulnerable, especially kids with asthma. Um, the families with, um, who have kids with asthma face stress, miss work and school days, high he health care costs. And, you know, we've seen kids who end up in the emergency room, the hospital, the ICU, and there have been deaths from asthma. It's a very serious disease. And that's why this bill is so important. And so to address the serious asthma burden, it's critical to get rid of the underlying triggers rather than treating kids day after day in hospitals and clinics with medication. Um, it's a vicious cycle because then we send them home to, place it, to a place that could have something that's triggering their asthma again. And the evidence is clear, as Dr. Evans very nicely summarized, so I don't need to go through that again. But really, the studies that show that reducing these triggers in homes um, reduces asthma symptoms, it really confirms this common sense approach. So as a pediatrician, a mom, and a New Yorker, I strongly support this bill. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Julie Jones. Uh, I Can you uh, just push the button on your mic? Now we see. Oh, six minutes lost. Good afternoon. My name is Jewel Jones. Um, I'd like to thank the committee, uh, the chair, Williams, and uh, especially uh, Councilperson Mendez. Um, I actually uh, live in East Harlem. Uh, I think there's been mention of the uh, impact of asthma rates in East Harlem, uh, the impact of um, uh, disproportionate services that, that, that afflict uh, East Harlem, uh, the hospitalization rates of, of, of individuals, of children, uh, within, of, in terms of asthma in East Harlem. I personally um, do not uh, suffer from asthma, nor, I know, nor, nor do I know anyone that does. I don't have children. 
uh, my residence is free of mold and pests and, pest and things of that nature. I, I actually sit here in support of this, uh, of this bill uh, as a proud member of WE Act um, and also as a, an advocate in my community of East Harlem. Um, um, the, the bill is important because uh, obviously healthy homes are important. Poor housing conditions can trigger or worsen respiratory health Ill illnesses, especially in children. The Asthma Free Housing Act will require landlords to regularly, ins regularly inspect homes for asthma triggering allergen hazards such as mold and insect infestations and correct their underlying causes, particularly in the homes of New York City's most susceptible success residents. And I mention again, living in East Harlem. Um, so I urge the uh, City Council, I urge this committee, I urge uh, them to support this bill. Uh, Intro 385, passed the Asthma Free Housing Act. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, good morning. I'm Dr. Mohammed from um, a community health center in the Bronx. In the past 20 years, we've seen lots of in, um, advancement in the management of asthma medically. Um, but when we look at triggers, not much has been done there. Um, we have d new medications coming out every year. We were tr we were every, oh, doctors are working with these new medications or patients are taking their medicines. We, uh, we educate them on the best way to take their medicine, how to take it, the best time to take it, before school, after school, but still they come back to our offices with asthma exacerbations, ED visits. Um, what, we do, what do we do? What do we do next? The moms don't know what to do. Moms are, um, they throw their arms up in the air, says, my child takes her medicine every day. Why is it that they're still having asthma? They sometimes don't know the mold is in the, in the house. They don't know the cockroach is causing the triggers of their asthma. They've reported, sometimes they've reported it so many times to the landlords, but nothing is getting done. And I'd like to share a story with you. One of my moms said to me, Doc, my son has no place to sleep. He, the, the rats have eaten out the bed and the sofas. And that's a sad th story to hear from your mom, who you've seen the child since he was a young baby, and now he's 12 years old and has no place to sleep because of rats and rat infestation. So I'm really asking for support in this bill uh, so that our children and our parents can have a better life. Good afternoon, my name is Shoshana Brown. I'm executive director of AIR NYC, where the AIR stands for Asthma Intervention and Relief. I'll just 